Um, we need to start the meeting now. Uh, my name is Jonathan James. I'm the head of custom services and the lead uh, city council officer for this committee. Um, before any of the proceedings start today, we need to elect a new chair for the committee. So, moving swiftly on, can I have any nominations for chair? My Thank you. Can I have a second, please? Right. Any other nominations for chair? Going, going, gone. Okay. Can I have uh, hands then for Jerry Bird as chair of the committee? Julie elected then is Jerry Bird as chair of this committee, and I will now pass the proceedings over to yourself. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, could I have nominations, please, for the vice chair? I'd like to nominate Councillor Mike Todd Jones. <laughs> is there a seconder? Okay, thanks, Nigel. Okay, any other nominations? No? Okay then, can we please take a vote for um, Mike Todd Jones as the Vice Chair? Thank you very much. Um, I'd just like to give a big thank you to um, Councillor Mike Todd Jones because he was chair for three years, um, or four years, in total, now tells me, um, which is really great. And uh, thank you so much for all the work. Thank you. Okay, any apologies, please? Okay, I've got apologies for Councillor O'Reilly and Councillor Price. Chair, uh, Councillor Manning. Councillor Manning? Okay, thank you. And Councillor Austin O'Reilly. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, also I would like to say um, a, a couple of um, things. I'd like to welcome um, particularly our new councillors, county councillor um, for um, King's Hedges and Arbury. So for Arbury we've got Jocelyn Scott, councillor, and uh, for uh, King's Hedges we've got Alisa Michelli. Oh, oh, yeah. um, and also our new city councillor, Patrick Shell. Okay, lovely, thank you. Um, also, what I need to uh, say is um, we have some councillors that have stood down. Charlotte Perry, who was a city councillor for Arbury, she's had a baby, so um, which is really great. And also Fiona Onsania, who was um, a county councillor for King's Hedges. Um, with particular mention, because congratulations to Fiona on her election as MP for Peterborough. <laughs> And I'd also like to explain to you why we um, have changed, what the boundaries have changed with the county. So, um, Elisa is um, a King's Hedges County Councillor, but she comes into East, part of East Chesterton, the city ward. It's very confusing. If you'd like us to explain a bit more, do come up to me in the info and I'll explain it all to you. Okay? Thank you very much. Okay, so, any declarations of interest? Okay. <coughs> Minutes of the last meeting. Okay, if I go through every page, page one, page two, page three, page four, 
page five, page six, page seven, page eight, page nine, page ten, page eleven, page twelve, page thirteen, page fourteen, page fifteen, page sixteen, page seventeen, page eighteen, page nineteen, page twenty and page twenty-one. <coughs> Any matters arising from the minutes? Councillor Tumpin? Uh, Councillor Manning had one or two changes which I don't which I don't have but he, he told me when he said he was ill. I don't know if they can be over to be incorporated later when he's next. Yes, if you'd like to send us an email then we'll make sure they're added on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so sorry, Mr. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Okay, the first one I've got is on page 27. Um, I was hoping that Councillor Manning would be here so we could discuss it with him because we wanted to remove some of the older parts of this action um, and try and update it to where we are now. Um, so what I'll say is um, We'll put it down that we're going to delete the older dates and restart from the 15th of December 2016. As you know, um, Green End Road is having a lot of work done on it, so this will be part of the stage three. So um, we'll get more of an update again at the next meeting. Okay, um, are all members happy with me doing that? Yeah. yeah? So, page 28, we have parking restrictions on the federal area and impact around um, Milton Road Library. Councillor Scott? Yes, um, I can report on this that we can remove that bit of the item that relates to yellow, double yellow lines on corners of roads intersecting with Milton Road, First Park Avenue, Ashen Road, and then round the corner to Gurney Way and Courtney Way and so on. It's all been done. So all the double yellow lines are down, so that can be slashed out. And then as for the um, parking, uh, we can report that the Cambridgeshire parking policy for residents only was passed by the, high, the Joint Area Committee and then the Highways Committee, so that's in place. And the extension plan for Cambridge City was passed by the Joint Area Committee and has been held up at the Highways Committee, but we're hopeful that it will come before the Highway Committee um, in due course and be <coughs> passed. But there are meetings being held with officers and councillors, or councillors involved in various bits of the residence parking that is related to here, and there will be workshops and so matters are progressing in terms of the residents only parking issue. But I won't be more specific than that because I think we need to wait for the meetings to be held with councillors and the officers and then for the workshops because that will inform everybody who wants to know about residents parking in these areas. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we're now on page 30 which is uh, to investigate which property services area around Tesco's continues to be untapped tidy. There is a large uncovered wire cage stole, litter bin and rubbish gets blown about. Um, Councillor Price is not here tonight. Um, he's 
have to, to work. So does anybody else have an update from King Sage's ward? No? Okay, we'll put that forward again for the next meeting. Okay, the next one is sharing open data to assist with setting of area committee police priorities. Um, Councillor Manning and Councillor Todd Jones. Um, Councillor Todd Jones? Uh, thank you, Chair. I can't really add in more to this. I mean, Councillor Manning kind of taking the lead on this. Uh, it may be that when we get to police priorities, Sergeant Bishop might want to say a bit more about that later on the agenda. Okay, okay, I've got another one for Councillor Manning. Um, Chester and Recreation Ground, um, toilets often locked and why? Um, so I think we'll wait until the next meeting for Councillor Manning to come back to us. Okay, the next one's the Meadows Community Centre. Um, Jackie Hansen to have a dialogue with Histon and Inverton Parish Council with regards to the Meadows Community Centre. Um, so I'll come back to Councillor Michael Jones. Uh, uh, thank you again, Chair. I mean, I have followed up a couple of times with Jackie. Do you have any look back to you with any specific comments on any dialogue with uh, Histon and Inverton Parish Council and contribution to the Meadows Centre? I suspect it may be that it falls slightly in the air because of the Community Centre Review. So it's subject uh, to the sort of outcome of the Community Centre Review. Lovely, thank you very much. <coughs> Next one is the Milton Road pavement and road services in need of repair. Um, all councillors, city and county, to action together. Um, I'm going to ask Councillor um, Scott to uh, feed back to us. Thank you. Um, it has come to my attention that there are white painted circles around some potholes on Milton Road which does seem to indicate that something is intended to happen to those potholes. So I'm actually endeavouring to check this up that's come to my attention recently. As to the, um, as to the Greater Cambridge Partnership, as it's now known, it's no longer known as the City Deal, so we'll have to correct that. It's the Greater Cambridge Partnership. Um, if, um, perhaps if I think later on the agenda I was intending to give a <clears throat> time. And I see that the next one's me also, if I can just continue, Councillor Blue, thank you. Um, the, on this one, I am checking with the cycle team and I am afraid that, that, uh, that I haven't um, managed to discuss with them whether the fact that there are changes going on on Arbury Road relating to cycling might mean that there can be improvements to the pavements too. But it is definitely correct, as is reported in that um, uh, update on the 15th of December, that the road and highways section of the county is not able to fix the footpath because it's not in a sufficient state of ill repair to come within their budgetary requirements. But I'm checking, as I say, with the cycling group to see if something can be done from there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're now going on to questions that were asked in the open forum at uh, our last meeting. Uh, Councillor Todd Jones to li liaise with the ambulance service to ensure emergency services have a com comprehensive list of. Do, 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 I can't say the word deliberate. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, stored in community buildings across the city. Uh, Councillor Mike Todd Jones. Uh, thank you again, Chair. Yes, um, I agreed with um, Councillor Oscar Gillespie because he also read this kind of independently, I see, at the West uh, Central Area Committee. Uh, I've also been in discussions with uh, Councillor Russell McPherson uh, and also Councillor uh, Tim Hall. Uh, so we have uh, Labour, Green, and Liberal Democrat, sort of cross party uh, little group who are working on this. Uh, and we look, we have, I've kind of had informal discussions with. Uh, City Council officers, and we're looking to have a, a formal meeting set up. Um, uh, Councillor Gillespie is leading on that, but I think we've all been rather engaged with uh, two sets of elections over the last uh, two and a half months or so. 
Uh, so it hasn't progressed as much as I would like. Uh, but that is still the intention to have a, a formal meeting with city council officers about not just the provision of defibrillators uh, at area committees, uh, but also to look at the um, provision at the Guild Hall. Uh, there are a few issues related to that as well. Um, so that's, that's the way we're intending to progress. Hopefully that will move on very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and the next one is Wall Councils to liaise with um, Mr Bond regarding replacement of damaged middle bollard on St Andrew's Rec cycle path. And I think we're all the same. It's the same as we've been so busy with elections, we haven't been able to do that, but we'll definitely feed back at the next meeting. Okay, the next one is um, on page 33. Um, Councillor Lightel Jones to pass on concerns um, from Mr. Davidson regarding damage to his garden by the City Council officers to the Chief Executive and Senior Officers. Uh, yes, just to say, and I think Mr. Davidson is aware that I passed his concerns on formally. Uh, I know he'd already written to the Chief Executive, um, and also I think he got a response from the Chief Executive and Joel Carey, I think. Um, but I, I followed that up and passed on those concerns over yourself as well. So I think that could be taken off the list now. Thank you. Lovely. Um, the next one is Council Scott to uh, check lighting levels in Hawkins and Camping Road area in response to residents' concerns. Yes. Raised um, by um, Mrs. Harris. That's right, yes. I'm in communication with the relevant team at the County Council on this. One of the difficulties is that it's the summer months and it's difficult to gauge the level of the lighting because it's already <coughs> light and the lighting is different from how it is in the winter. The main concern is in the winter, but it's on the list and so it will be dealt with and the particular <coughs> um, part of the, the team is on the job that I'll report at the next committee. <coughs> Okay, the next one is uh, Councillor uh, Todd Jones to follow up with John Parrott about lack of lighting concerns in the Bar Barrowdale a bus shelter raised by Mrs. Rumbold. Uh, yes, thank you again, Chair. Yes, I've um, followed this up uh, by emailing uh, John Parrott, who I think we want to send the City Council on so responsible. Um, and Lillian kindly suggested that one option, we didn't want to. Uh, either install or reinstate the actual bus shelter light was perhaps to have uh, the illuminated uh, advertising signage as a way of lighting the bus shelter which is a, is a innovative idea and maybe they will follow up that but there are similar uh, illuminated signs at other bus shelters along Houston Road as well. Um, so I put that sort of option to John Parrott as well as actually um, uh, having a, a light itself in the Forradale bus shelter. Um, I'm waiting to wait to hear back from him, but um, uh, that, that will progress through myself and John Power. I'm happy to copy you in, Lillian, about how that's going to proceed. <coughs> that's all in hand, anyway. Sorry, Lillian, for mispronouncing your name. Okay, the next one is Councillor Todd Jones to follow up with planning officers if city deals should be consulted in. Yes, I did that and got a response that yes, uh, the city deal uh, issues are all taken into account of, and I think it's a formal process by uh, city council, the planning authority. So I don't think we need to say any more, really. That's, that's, <coughs> that's what they do, and I think it can be taken off the list. Lovely, thank you. And the next one again is Councillor Michael Jones to follow up with Andrew Preston regarding Fen Road work progress query raised by Mr. Taylor. Um, and Councillor Manning to attend local highways improvement panel in January 2017 and will pass on to Mr Taylor's comments, e.g. lack of pub uh, publicly uh, available information. Yeah, thank you again, Chair. Well, we did have um, you know, a bit of a debate about this. I think last time there might have been two North Area Committees ago, um, and we did, we, there was quite a bit of publicity, including display from Andy Preston and his team the last time we met at um, North Kenji Academy, it was in the summer last year. Uh, and then there was a bit of discussion about the various elements of the Fen Road scheme being installed. And I think at one point, and it might be the point of the last Monterey Committee, why, which is why it's still on the agenda, 
Um, I think elements, some elements are being installed. I think possibly the bollards or not the speed cushion or the other way around. But I think very soon, I think we did have dates for finishing the installation of all the elements for the Fenway team. And as far as I'm aware, I have followed up with Andy Preston but haven't had a response recently. Um, it's all in place and perhaps East Chester Council are to respond on that that scheme is fully in place and it's all functioning as hoped. That is my understanding. Okay, thank you. We'll, um, we'll get in touch with Mr. Manning and uh, Councillor Manning and see what I can find out. Um, okay, we're now on to police and um, safer neighbourhoods. Um, Sergeant Miskell uh, to clarify reasons for increase in a cycle theft in West Chesterton. Um, an update, uh, we received an update on the 22nd of the 12th, 16. Um, and I think these we ought to um, ask um, Sergeant Miskell when it's his time to speak, if that's okay by the committee. back on that one so I'll just quickly read through. Community cohesion officers is in contact with police hate crime tackling group and attends a monthly meeting with Dawn Whiffin from police headquarters and will raise the issue at the next meeting and update the area committee on any further improvement. 
online hate crime can be reported directly at a police station or online through a True Vision website, which is a national website dedicated to report all types of hate crime. This web <coughs> website has gone through improvements and is more customer friendly than when it first launched. Once a report is made by the True Vision website, the nearest uh, constabulary will be notified of the complaint and a local police person will then follow up on the report. Okay, the next one I've got is Councillor Todd Jones to follow up with the police and residents regarding the drug dealing in the Bermuda Flats area. Uh, thank you again, Chair. I mean, Kelly might want to add something, but um, I'm looking to uh, arrange a meeting not just about issues around the Bermuda Flats there, which was raised, I think, by Kate Harris um, a meeting or two ago, uh, but, uh, but other issues in the Arbury area. Um, so um, that, that's, the, that's the plan, that's the intention, is to have a meeting with uh, the police, with officers at City Homes North, uh, and others in the community safety team uh, to look at a range of issues uh, related to drug dealing and social in the Arbury area. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and then we're on to environmental uh, report. Uh, Wendy Young to liaise with owner of recycling um, shelf in uh, Alstone Road regarding appropriate signage to advertise the recycling shelf. The next, um, and we've got no report back, the next one is environmental report. Wendy Young to provide details of follow-up action taken after multiple e um, needles dumped in King's Hedges. Um, and the next one is enforcement patrols to tackle fly tipping to be undertaken in uh, Maitland Avenue and Walklock Road um, area as per page 39 of the officer's report. <laughs> It's real, it must be old too. I can't stop it. Chair, there's a new officer report. I thought we were going to get some feedback through the officers today on those environmental reports. Is there nothing available? There's one there, there's a, a collection of them on the bench there, so if you'd like it, so you can read through what the environmental improvements have been. Okay. Okay. We'll now start the open forum. Um, as you know, we only have um, 30 minutes. I'm going to have to be really tight with times because we've got a lot to get through to with tonight. So um, the first one um, I've got is Lillian. Yeah. The open forum, would you like to give me your... Yes, uh, it's uh, the one about... It's about the double yellow line you're referring to. Yes. Okay, good. Uh, it's because of the um, parking scheme, it's a new parking scheme for zone 12 that excludes then uh, the McManus estate with the Maple School. And uh, we do uh, anticipate if uh, the residential parking scheme goes through that we will have uh, displaced commute parking in our area, and especially damaging to the Maple School. So uh, we are proposing uh, that we should submit an uh, LHI bid regarding double yellow lines on Carisbrook Road from number 40 on the even side along the edge of Mayfield School towards Work Road to be submitted soonest. Uh, since I sent this in, I have had um, an email conversation with uh, uh, the Mayfield School's headmaster, and uh, they have replied that in principle we are positive be a little bit concerned about maybe instead of the even side should be the odd side and what do we do with the uh, some of the personnel parking so it was uh, basically positive from the school and you had another one you had another one at um, <coughs> station yes um, 
bus priority. We love bus priority here. So I would like to raise this question regarding Cambridge North Station and public transport for residents along Histon Road. At present, there is no public transport available. The only option would be that the guided bus be made one stop, for instance, at the Ackerman Street bus stop to accommodate travel to the North Station. It would involve one change required in Ox uh, Orchard Park area. As this route will not create congestion and air pollution in the Cambridge City Centre, it is in line with the clean air concept supported by the CPD. So your early attention to this problem is greatly appreciated. Um, Todd Jones first and then Ansel Scott. Yeah, thank you Chair. I can respond on the first point. Um, and uh, what I suggested in the rather than in anticipation of potential residents, um, those sort of parking zones coming forward, um, that we let the Aidwood Maple School, as you started doing, uh, and look at a uh, project that's simply based upon safety requirements outside Mayfield School and where the yellow lines might be required. Um, if that to be a, an LHI bid, then obviously it would have to fit in the local highways improvement uh, project. It have to fit in with the time scale. Uh, and the next round will be, I think, coming up uh, later on this year. Uh, and then, yeah, I think it's an annual process. So we'll, look, we'll be looking to put a bid in there. But nothing to stop us starting straight away to discuss with the head of Mayfield School and get a highways officer out, have a look at the area and where where the sensible place we can we might go. Okay? Very positive, thank you. Thank you. Um, I just actually wanted to be registered in the minutes that there's a real difficulty here because of the boundary changes. Because uh, Mrs. Rundland has raised a matter that really is for the West Area Committee because Matt Manus is well the question is where you should it lie, because McManus Estate is in the city castle zone, but it's in the Arbury zone for the county, and WLA lines are a county matter. Now, is it, I know it's a north matter, no, it's not a north matter, it's a west matter, really, and I'm just putting it on notice that really these area committees are city council committees but they affect county council areas. And therefore, in my view, whoever is the lead councillor, I assume it's possibly Anna Smith, that we need to really discuss with her how we're going to actually deal with the area committees when they have these crossovers in the boundaries. Because as I say, Mrs Rundland is in a difficult position. She's coming here because her county councillor is here, but <coughs> she's in West, uh, in West Area, this is the city, and, and therefore I'm highlighting that it's a very difficult issue, and I would be prepared to go to West Area Committee, and I would be prepared to sit on West Area Committee regularly as a member, and in my opinion, this really needs to be looked at. Okay, thank you very much. Professor Smart. Thank you, Chair, and congratulations on the Chair. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, on the first one, the thing about the WO lines. I mean, I'm no expert on the parking schemes. It's a county council thing, I'm a city councillor. But I don't know if the, if the WO lines come as a sort of package of measures that come with the parking scheme. Maybe the county councillors around the table know better than me or some of the longer serving city councillors. So and if that's the case, it might be better just to get the WO lines paid for in that um, package of stuff. And anyway, city deal is offering to pay for at least some of that, I think, yeah. anyway. But it's, I don't want you, but you just want it done. But I mean, I just say no, the no. best place to get the money from that. So, yeah. Yeah. No, there is another point as well. The zone 12 parking zone does not cover this area, and that's why we are worried about the displaced commuter parking from that area. And we, uh, I don't think we will be for a long time included in the parking scheme. Mm -hmm. right. Councillor Mike Judge. Yeah, just to say uh, that that is essentially right. It could be uh, a long time before we get to a situation where uh, you know, new areas to be covered by residence parking zones um, include either the vicinity of 
make the school in McManus or even that area itself. Uh, it could be quite a few years off. So I would suggest um, what, I, what I proposed originally, which is uh, whichever is the best way forward, taking, uh, taking on board what Councillor Scott has just said about how we progress it, but that we look at uh, an LHI scheme, um, working with the school, the most appropriate areas, go with the WLI line to go in and, and do that as soon as possible that way. Okay, thank you very much. And you had another one which was like bus shelter lights? Yes. Yeah, okay, that's okay. <coughs> okay, the ne next one I've got is Ruth Yule. Do you want to save yours, Ruth, until um, um, Alan Neville has done his presentation? Yes, and then that's you can, Is that okay? That's fine. Lovely. Okay, so the next one I've got, Kay. Um, I've got two questions in, and both about roads. The first question is French's Road, which is a small road um, by Bermuda Community Road. We want to cut everything tonight. Um, half the road was surfaced last year. Our, our MP promised faithfully that the whole road was going to be surfaced, but when it came to it, only half of it was done because they had run out of money. We would like to know when the road is going to be completely resurfaced. The second part is we've had a lot of repairs done. Strips are here, strips there. And they already begin to break up and sink. And to be quite true, I've, a lot of residents feel that what has been done is a waste of money. Scott, do you want to come back on that? Yeah. Um, what uh, Mrs Harris has raised is actually a very important issue. I'm on the Highways Committee at County and we did have a discussion about whether we should be concentrating the funding on filling up potholes primarily or on preventive measures. And I have to say that there was a division of opinion within the Highways Committee as to which way we should go. Uh, it may, but I don't know how it will go down with the people here, but in a way I favour prevention because it seems to me that if we prevent the potholes from coming in the first place and do a proper job, then we're not going to be having this problem that, that you raise. On the other hand, that people don't like potholes in the middle of the road and they are dangerous, so I'm afraid that we're caught between a rock and a hard place, as they say, because of the, the, the funding problem. And that's, I have to say, principally why I have actually favoured looking constructively at what the Greater Cambridge Partnership is doing, because there is money there to actually fix up roads in a proper way from the under the surface and the over surface, which is really what needs to be done. But I, what I will do specifically on this, and I will undertake to do, is go back to the highways uh, group and discover what material was used and what the lifetime of that material is supposed to be, and if they can research to find some material that can fill potholes and that might have a longer life. I think that's uh, the best that I can do at the moment, but when I talk with them, I might come up with an even better response and I'll bring it back to the next meeting. May I add to that, please? It's not so much to the strip of repairs that's done, but it's the surface underneath. If the surface underneath had been repaired in the beginning, you wouldn't have it sinking and breaking. No, and if I could just add this little bit, um, it's not directly on point, but it may be useful for people to know. There's an instance where in uh, um, my division where somebody got in touch with me because they said our road is actually being fixed and it doesn't need to be fixed because it's in good condition. And what I discovered they do up at the county is this. There were 10 roads in that area that they were fixing and this was the 10th road. The nine roads were in the orange mode. They have green, orange, red. Green is when it's all right. There's nothing wrong with it, in their view. Orange is when it's just on the edge and it really needs repair to bring it back into the green. And red is when it's absolutely beyond redemption. And what they were doing, the nine roads had been fallen into their 
orange category, and this one was in the green, but it was right on the edge of the green. So they decided to fix up the whole 10 rows because that was more um, economical to fix the whole 10 rows in a proper way than to fix nine and then wait until the other one went over into the orange. But I'm just raising it because people may have a difference of opinion on this too, but it does seem to me that it's wise to be fixing the orange rows because they actually are fixable and redeemable and able to be brought back into green. Now that means the red rows are in this category of un, un, unredeemable, which isn't a good thing. But I accept what you're saying, Mrs. Harris, and I'll take it to the highways and talk to them about what's used underneath as well, because I absolutely accept that if we're going to have decent roads in this um, in Cambridgeshire, we have to worry about what's under the surface as well as what, what it looks like on the top. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, just to add, um, the, um, the, the resurfacing a section that was done in Trenches Road, Kay, was a, in, in answer to a specific need, a request from residents, uh, both to, there was a particularly poor condition of the surface, and also to reinstate that we are aligned alongside the carpenter's arms. So I led on that project with the support of Councillor Scott. And it was separate from the city deal, that was, uh, that was our own initiative, following residents' request to do that. Um, and it just addressed that particular need. <coughs> Thank you. Um, Barbara Taylor? My question, um, my, my question relates to illegal parking on Horton Road. What is being done to stop the illegal car parking on Horton Road Verges? And, and this also is um, there's dangerous parking, thoughtless parking on, on the, not just on the Verges as well, and on Horton Road. Um, so this has increased in the last couple of years because of rental of houses on Water Road and uh, houses of multiple occupancy. Um, I've lived on the road for over 35 years and I do remember pre-bus lane times when there were double yellow lines on both sides of road. So I, you know, I presume that that still stands, so it is illegal parking on the verges. Um, it's, and also it's just making a mess of Water Road and turning it into a slum. Um, the city deal won't be removing the road until at least 2020, so we need to do something about it before then. Okay, thank you. Oh, also, sorry, we do have some examples. Some, oh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Say something about that. So I registered myself about parking, and I've, uh, I've been cycling up and down Milton Road recently. I've sort of counted the number of cars parked on the verge in the cycle lane on the pavement, and so on. And it's generally getting on for about six on average. Can be worse, not much better on me. And um, yeah, I think it is a problem. And I've talked to the police about it, and as the chap here tonight, I guess, will say it's not a, a, a police issue, apparently. I think, unless and I'm not a, an expert, maybe you could say something, but the, uh, unless they're actually physically parked in, on the pavement, you know, blocking everybody or something like that, the police won't do it. And then we've got the County Council Parking Services team, and I've made an inquiry there and not got a response back yet, but I believe that's probably the only way to do it. And maybe the thing to do is just to make information about that much more available to residents. And because uh, as well as us councillors, you know, residents can also get in touch with the county council about that too. And, and just to sum up, what I see as the problem is not so much the, the, the black Range Rover, that, you know, Land Rover that was parked there for a week recently and got on the news, newspaper. It's not the one car, it's the fact that there are several cars parked all the time. So that if you're cycling or walking, pushing a buggy, whatever, trying to get around and there are things in the way, it's just not only annoying, but it's also dangerous because it means that cycles, you know, the, the uh, sort of nervous cyclists will approach an object and not swerve out gradually, so the cars sort of go round gradually. A cyclist that doesn't have the confidence will go along the curve and will suddenly sort of jut out into the road round the object, and that can be a dangerous thing to do, and that can mean you're knocked off your bike. And it's, there are similar problems with pedestrians too. I think 
the parking on Milton Road, and, and the bit I was talking about particularly is between King's Edge Road and Arnold Road, is a potentially dangerous thing, and that's why I've talked to the police about it, but we can't seem to get much done there. But uh, it's something we need to, to sort of fight, I think, on a regular basis, hopefully, until Milton Road is redone and maybe the situation will be improved going forward. But it's, it just is lots of people parking for all sorts of reasons. Just a short delivery can be half an hour, but it's just at any point of the day, there all seems to be vehicles in the pavement and in the cycle lane, which is ruined for everyone else to use the road. And I'm really something I want to continue to try to tackle. And I'll be, I mean, my main point, I think, was to go to County Council now to really get onto them to be giving people tickets all the time. Perhaps that's the best, best approach, I suppose, to really kind of come down on it. Yeah, Barbara, I mean, the best way of getting enforcement is if there is double yellow lines because then you can get the parking people in because you're not allowed to park anywhere up to the um, pavement in that situation. And I live on Gilbert Road and uh, we regularly get enforcement on Gilbert Road when um, people park on the verge. Um, any other risk? Restrictions on the road, such as bus lanes, um, if there are, are no double yellow lines on the bus lane, as I understand it, it's not enforceable by the parking people, and then you're relying on, on other measures. So I think certainly with um, the city deal, we need to make sure that um, we have something like double yellow lines for the whole length, so that um, we can also enforce when people uh, park on the verge. Thank you. And I will say that I saw a car parked on the verge um, yesterday in East Chesterton on Green End Road and um, the local police had put on a ticket warning them if they park on there again they'll get a £30 fine. So um, the, pe the police do do their job, they are looking. Um, and um, so I I'll pass on now to Council Scott. Thank you. Yeah. Just really briefly. Um, a resident from Gilbert Road contacted me about two days ago. I got onto the uh, County Council head of the parking enforcement. He asked me to get information from her as to what time of day it was that they were parking on there. You know, what, I mean, she didn't have to see them driving on. But were they there at 10 o'clock, were they there at 11 o'clock, etc. And therefore, if the parking inspector knows what times it is that they're there, that's when they'll go down and, and, and do their, in, their enforcement notices and so forth. So they're going to go down there on a regular basis that time. So what I would suggest, Mrs Taylor, is if you notify uh, Mr. Uh, Councillor Smart, because he's dealing with it with the county, Give him the times that they turn up, then that will help the parking inspectors to make sure they go down there at a time when they're likely to apprehend the, the people and, and put notices on them and that they'll be sure that they're there. That's what I can suggest. And they will be diligent. They are good. Thank you. Councillor Lutcher. Thank you. Look, I will just go into a oh, more than I um, I was just going to say that as a short, well, not so much a short term, but we have in King's Edges a good record of actually trying to go around this problem of illegal parking on verges by putting in LHI bids for traffic regulation orders that effectively put um, a stop, a ban on verge parking. We've done that on Camping Road, we've done that on Ramsden Square most recently. Uh, we were going to do that on Lovell Road, and we could do that on Milton Road as well. If it was of interest, it's, I think, something that we could definitely apply for. It's got good solid, res it's got good solid precedent, and it seems to work. So I know we've got until 2020 to worry about actual, proper, you know, what, what will come out of the city deal, but that's something that we could do in the next year. So I would look into it. Thank you. Um, uh, Doug White? Um, yeah, we, can. we can move this on to when the police um, talk, because uh, I've just spoken to them, so talk to the highway or something. Okay, thank you. And we'll have time for just one more because um, we've nearly got to the time. Uh, Richard Spencer. Hello. 
Uh, yeah, I wanted to bring it to the attention of the committee that uh, we have a, a, an outstanding um, uh, issue with the management of North Cambridge Station at the moment uh, with regard to what reminds me was a very flagrant breach of the planning consent that they were given back in 2012, I believe, uh, insofar as it's related to um, the environmental mitigation plan. Uh, and involved uh, the destruction of a line of trees and uh, an area of habitat which was clearly marked on the environmental mitigation plan as, um, as to be retained and enhanced for the benefit of wildlife and also for screening of local residents. Um, now this is being progressed by South Cambridgeshire District Council uh, Planning Enforcement uh, and uh, I know that our, our County Council Ian Manning is, is also aware of it. Um, but I, I thought this committee should also be aware of it because although I believe most of the station site is on South Cambridge land, this particular strip down the back of Long Beach Road is actually on city council on city land, I believe. And the people who are affected by this are actually city residents. Um, and the response, my initial response, well, this response that we've had from Network Rail has been a, a bit grudging in, in my view. Is, uh, they seem to be uh, dragging their feet as much as possible. So this is just an issue that I, I, I wanted to bring to the attention of the committee um, in the hope that maybe you can support us and support South Cambridge District Council in enforcing the planning consent that was given. Okay, thank you very much. Councillor Sands? Yes, I'd like to thank Mr Spencer for um, having brought this to the attention of um, councillors. Both uh, uh, County Councillor Manning and I have been uh, applying pressure on the planning departments of both the city and South Cairns to ensure that any agreements that Network Rail have entered into are kept to with respect to this. Um, now, obviously, the planning officers have to be allowed uh, to proceed to, to they are the other people responsible for enforcement, but thanks to Mr Spencer and his neighbours, uh, I think pressurising on this uh, is given the council the opportunity to, I think, to, uh, 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 apply added pressure to ensure that officers are doing that. But I think it's, it's, it's a very good example, um, as we move forward at the station, that in order for good relations to be maintained between residents and uh, network rail and the management of the station site, it's vital that any agreements that have been entered into with respect to the protection of the environment and local residential amenity uh, and any uh, assurances that have been given need to be stuck to. Uh, so it's vital for this, we all want this project to work, but it needs to be uh, proceed on the basis of delivery for residents as well as for uh, 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 broader commuters. Thank you very much for that. Um, okay, I've got three more here, um, which um, we won't get time to answer, but what I'll do is I'll get your contact details and make sure the officers and councillors come back to you. I'm already talking to a couple of councillors about it. I was rather hoping to make the matters public. If I shan't get a okay, chance to well, that, I can't. No, fine. it's all right. Uh, <laughs> okay. Have Davis. Yeah. If, if you want to quickly say what they are, and if the officers or the okay. councillors already working on it, then it seems great. Well, I'll do them in reverse order. Um, one was the fact that I noticed bin collection seems to have gone rather awry in lots of Cambridge. If you find yourself behind a bin van ever right now, you'll notice they are particularly smelly in this heat. I wanted to know as a matter of urgency if the city or county council doing collections have done a risk assessment for the impact, the public health impact, dragging possibly three week old fermenting food around in the back of an open lorry with other people breathing that in and taking an aerosol of that up under current and actually quite imminent risk. Secondly, uh, regarding the hedge um, relaying on Arbury Road, um, I don't know if any of you guys have any deals with the city deal on this. They didn't really consult. The consultation said we reduced part of it. We removed all of it right at the tail end of the, of the planting season and we planted in a very, in a way, very insensitive to local ecology and local hedging culture. 
They didn't really talk to people, they didn't really get any input on what to plant. I compare that with how Milton Road has been handled, and I think residents of King's Hedges are getting a pretty bad deal on that. I don't feel as the great <coughs> city gave way to Cambridge Partnership that's involved in Ivory Road. Yeah, yeah, it's the is. county council. No, it's, it's, yeah, it's the great Cambridge uh, Partnership. Well, then we'll raise it. We'll, I'll certainly raise it with them. We have no doubt about it. Yeah, because uh, they're in the news even today saying that they recognise that there is a need for proper consultation with uh, residents about their project so that I'm sure that they will want to hear that, that there is a concern yeah. about that. Yeah, thank you. If I could just very, very quickly, yeah, I've been, I've been in conversation with Cabela about this. We've already had, it seems like a very long time ago, but we had before the election, literally it feels like an eternity ago, but it was just a couple of weeks before the election, I had a meeting with Vanessa and Claire, um, and the, some of the issues that he raised came up, so I'm following up with them on these issues, and the rest of the things that you bring up, I am going to bring them up with my dailies when I can get hold of him, so I'm on it, I promise. Thank you. Okay, one more. I'm, I'm happy to take up the bins issue uh, with Executive Council. I've had other complaints of residents to do with uh, health hazards, to do with bin collections at this moment in time, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll discuss that with Rosie Moore and bring that back to the next area committee. Donning my professional hat as a microbiologist and worried about this. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Okay, that's the end of the uh, open forum. Like I say, any questions that haven't been um, dealt with, we'll make sure we contact you with some answers. Okay, we've now got a presentation from Cambridge North Station update. Um, Alan Neville from Great Anglia. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, fantastic to be back. Um, Seems a bit of a long time ago, actually. It was February when I was here before, actually. Um, yes, I enjoyed it so much, I've come back. No, it's very, very kind of you to um, invite me back, actually. Um, I'm excited to be here to tell you about the um, open Cambridge Station North, or Cambridge North Station, should I say. Um, we opened on time. Fantastic. Um, can I just ask you, um, not wishing to embarrass anyone. Hands up if you've been there and um, travelled from there. Yeah. Wow, that's fantastic. Excellent. Okay, well, the last time I came, which as I say, I believe was the end of February, I was moving from a um, customer engagement role, which I'm still pursuing a little bit, um, into the um, accessibility and um, integration manager's role. I remember that well because there were several questions about accessibility um, at that time, and I was like two days into the role. <laughs> yes, I remember Councillor <laughs> Um So um, I'm now Acting Accessibility and Integration Manager, and what that means is all matters accessibility and integration, which is integration basically um, with other forms of transport. So that's station travel planning, liaising with the bus companies, uh, the cycle forums, you name it, um, that's my role and a very exciting role it is. Um, now this isn't going to be death by PowerPoint, there's only very, very few slides. What I want it to be tonight is um, your questions and um, hopefully my answers. Um, so I want to be able to answer anything you ask me about Cambridge North. So that could be about cycles, it could be about the station, it could be about our staff, it could be about co connectivity. But what I wanted to tell you about was the, um, the excitement of opening a um, new station, basically. A um, bit of a privilege um, for those managers around in the area to be involved in something like this. It's not every day we get a new station, particularly one um, costing 50 million and, and the size that Cambridge North is. Um, the first two days, as you can imagine, were absolutely buzzing. I must stress, however, that the actual high profile, very big launch still hasn't happened. And, and I'm sure you can guess why that didn't happen. Certain political events which um, overtook us at the time, actually. Um, so it was um, reasonably low profile, but on the other hand, a big media presence. Um, 
I was on the first train from um, Cambridge to Cambridge North, along with a lot of other people. Uh, within the space of me ha arriving, half an hour later, um, I was asked to do Facebook Live. Um, me being a bit old school, I didn't really know what the um, impact of that was going to be, but apparently I was sort of liaising with about 1,600 people instantly, which was a little bit frightening. Um, about an hour or so later, they asked me to do um, a piece for um, ITV, the ITV local news, which um, went over that Sunday evening, which apparently went um, pretty well. Um, our managing director, Jamie Burles, was there on the Monday all day, and you may have seen him on uh, Look East that evening, talking about, um, about the station. And the interest continues because at um, 7.30, well, about 7.40 this morning, um, for those of you who were awake at that time, um, I was on Radio Cambridgeshire um, asking, um, being asked questions about uh, Cambridge North um, four weeks on. Um, so, coincidental that here I am tonight on the same day to talk about the to, to talk about the four, first four weeks and to answer questions. Um, obviously, um, a new station coming to live, as I say, very exciting, but a hell of a lot of hard work. I've talked about the media, but it's not just about the media. Obviously, our local management at Cambridge, huge job in training staff, familiarisation of staff, um, all the wants and requirements of a new station, everything from paper clips to station signage. Um, so a huge job and um, so I think it's a credit to, to Paul and his team um, that everything was there ready on um, day one for the customer to see. So um, the slides, first one please. So the Cambridge Way, what else could I show you but an array of bicycles? So we really, really are chuffed to bits that the number of cycles has grown every day, day in, day out. Um, I told you last time there was space for a thousand. Um, it's not yet full, but it's filling up very well indeed. Um, I'm also talking to various um, cycle groups and companies who want to establish links with the station and the science park and the station and the wider community. So that's work in progress. What is particularly exciting is, and we talked about the reasons for Cambridge Station being built uh, in February, um, and obviously one of them was the connectivity with the science park and the business park. And we are doing some surveys at the moment to find out how many bicycles, whether they be Bromptons or full-size non-folding are arriving um, at the station. Again, that number's growing. We've done two days this week and about 45 bikes were arriving in the space of um, between seven o'clock and nine o'clock at the station. Um, and we've been, I've been doing some little surveys myself, but more on that in a minute. So next slide, please. So, um, we stressed um, in um, both Network Rail and myself way back in February about the community and its place in your community. And the reason I wanted to show you this picture, because I'm a bit of a photographer and I particularly like the colours on that one actually. Um, I did manage, unfortunately, and if you were really going to critique this, I, I didn't get the um, man's uh, foot fully in the picture on the uh, right hand side, but hey ho. Um, so that shows the, um, the new trees, it shows the seats, um, it shows the interest on the Sunday of people just coming along in the community to have a look at the station and of course it shows the, uh, the new signage which has gone up as well. Okay. So um, the first day, um, on your left we have um, our, our Tanya who was an employee at Cambridge Station who uh, wanted to work at Cambridge North, and um, she's a very, very important part of the welcome host team at Cambridge North. Very skilled, excellent customer service, um, featured on uh, Radio Cambridge in the past, etc., for her customer service skills, and there she is um, by the uh, machine helping someone. 
On the right hand side, I um, don't know if anyone will recognise anyone there, but three people who are being filmed for um, the um, ITV News that night. I was standing obviously just behind them and um, they, as you can see from their faces, were, were loving it and loving the station. And obviously probably delighted that we're going to be on television that evening as well. But the one thing I must stress is we had sunny days for both those days as well. So, yeah. Okay. So, um, I've called this um, Reflections and Coffee. Um, the first one um, on the left hand side is, you've probably read, and I think I explained to you last time, about the, the pattern of the building, the pattern of the steelwork, and um, its associations with um, Cambridge um, University um, and mathematics. Um, I'm not going to dwell on that now, but it was designed uh, for a reason, and um, it looks amazing when the sun's shining, which it has been doing a lot recently. And um, again, the photographer in me had to take that picture, uh, just loving the design work on that as well. Because I think the reason I'm telling you this is we've, we've got a unique station there, really. It's, it's like no other I've seen, and someone has actually described it as looking very German. I actually think it looks a little bit Arabic as well, possibly, but anyway. Um, now on the, on the right hand side, for those people who've said and are about to ask, there's no coffee, I've got news for you. There is a permanent feature coming soon, I'm, I'm led to believe there's two retail outlets coming soon, but what we've got at the moment is Rebecca. Now Rebecca operates at um, what I first thought was an ice cream store when I saw it, but what it is actually is... Um, she pedals away on the back of her bike. By pedalling, she grounds the grinds the coffee. Hence, you get fresh ground coffee instantly. And she's there each morning selling her coffee. I believe she's going to start uh, diversifying into um, some types of food shortly. So, um, yeah, um, very popular she is too, and very, very good at customer service she is too, even though she doesn't actually work for us but we got her. Next one, please. So, um, the last two slides are some sound bites. I went up there last Saturday morning um, to get some sound bites from people, and I'll just read them through to you. Live in St Ives, first visit, it's going to be useful. Second visit, less crowded than Cambridge and a better experience. We live in Impington, first visit, we have a push chair and cargo bike, great. Second visit, very useful, awesome in fact, and better for cycling. Using trains more often now that we have new station. Everyone who I've spoken to in Histon thinks it's great. I live locally, it is very big, it looks like a German station, it's convenient. Second visit, I live locally, it's going to be useful, making all the difference. <coughs> Live locally, better for us, definitely going to make more rail journeys. Right, this is a typical weekday, Monday morning in fact. It's very good for me, frequency of trains too low though. Work on the science park, would like to see cross country stopping here. Live in Chesterton, proving useful. Live in Tevisham, very useful, great and easier. Live in Histon, definitely useful. Transferred from car to bike to reach Audley End. Travel from London to Science Park, previously used taxi or bus. Live locally, I'm travelling to Stevenage. I live in Swavesey, useful to me, I previously drove. First journey, use guided bus from St Ives, destination Stansted Airport. Travelling from Ely to the Science Park, very useful, previously used Cambridge, I'm saving 20 minutes every day. London to the Science Park, two to three times weekly. Previously used taxi to get from Cambridge to the Science Park. Live locally, bike to station, destination Whittlesford. Great convenience. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, I think I've probably got a quarter of an hour. I think at eight to eight o'clock? Yeah. yeah. So, um, I stress it was a short presentation because I didn't want to... Um, 
bore you with um, lots and lots of slides. Um, for those of you who've been, you've seen the station, so there wasn't much point in showing you loads and loads of pictures of it, and we showed you those um, last time anyway. Um, so without further ado, um, I hope you've got stacks of questions about anything under the sun, and I'll do my best to um, answer them. If I don't manage to answer them, you've got to grab me in the interval and force me to give you my email address, which I'll be too pleased to give you. Thank you. Right. Um, okay, the first one I've got is Ruth. Ruth. Yes, it's absolutely great to have the station on the doorstep. And anything I say isn't a criticism of the staff who are marvellous. But do you have any comment on the facilities? This is based on go using the station on Saturday morning. When one of the lifts was out of action, the lift from the concourse, two one of the ticket machines wasn't working at all, and the other one was intermittently only. And so there was a big queue for tickets. There was also a considerable queue for the ladies' loo, which has two toilet cubicles for the entire station, which is frankly not adequate. Um, I was there with my walking stick, and it leaves me wondering what arrangements are in place to help people with walking difficulties as opposed to wheelchairs and heavy luggage, because there were people with luggage struggling to get down at the end of the day. Okay. And this isn't the first time the lift's no. broken. No. Right, okay, um, absolutely valid points, and thank you very much for your initial remark. Um, I'm going to be quite upfront and honest and truthful with you here, but first, first of all, I'll just mention a toilet issue. Um, we were given the station, if you like, with the toilets that are there, basically. So irrespective of whether Greater Anglia or Govia Thameslink had said, actually we want double the size, then that's what we've got. Do you want to just answer that one? There were three cubicles on the original plan when it was a county council application, and I commented then, and I think I was not alone, that three wouldn't be enough based on experience of Cambridge Station, where the ladies' rooms have been much improved, it must be said. Okay. There's six at Cambridge Station, and I have to say, potty parity is a huge <laughs> issue, and it has to be taken up, and I will say that there will be demonstrations, there will be absolutely demands that there are more loos for women at that station. You are not going to get away with two loos. Please rest assured that it is not going to remain that way. Okay. And however much it's going to cost for retrofitting, it must be done. And it's okay. a health issue. It's a health and safety issue. Absolutely imperative. Okay, well, I promise you I will take that away. Uh, there are some snagging issues which we're tackling with uh, the builders, um, Volker Fitzpatrick who built the station for network rail. We, I will take that away, I promise you. Um, <clears throat> it's not within my remit to extend the ladies, um, but I take your point. I'm very much aware of how crowded the ladies at Cambridge Station get. I think I told her last time the footfall of Cambridge Station in the last year had gone up half a million. That's the scale of it, and, and that's the effect it will have on toilets. And as someone who doesn't necessarily use the staff toilets at Cambridge Station, I regularly use the public ones. I know that sometimes there's a line for the urinals as well. So, yes, leave it with me. Okay, now moving on to the other. First of all, the lifts. I'm not pleased at the moment about the lifts. I've made my feelings known and the customer service area manager has made his feelings known as well. We have got a few issues with the lifts at the moment. I got directly involved in the weekend issue. We scrambled engineers there from, um, if you like, agency for Volker Fitzpatrick, who are still actually responsible because it's still, if you like, under warranty, so to speak. We scrambled them there and got them there, and I'm not going to deny we've had them there today as well again, okay? So, believe you me, um, and again, something's being done, and I'll tell you what's being done, is that the directors of the company are being summoned to a meeting very quickly, because four weeks on, we shouldn't have one day or two days when those lifts are giving problems. 
in respect to what we will do if you turn up in a wheelchair or whatever, we will make every consideration, every arrangement possible to get you from A to B. Now I, myself, helped a lady up the steps with her bike. It was a heavy bike as well, so I know the inconvenience. But please trust me, when I'm not going to stand here and say there hasn't been a problem with the lift, and I'm not going to stand here and say there wasn't a problem this morning with the lift. What I am telling you about is being addressed at a very, very high level. The ticket machines on Monday were functioning very well indeed. However, however, again, I'm not going to stand here and tell you that they've been perfect and we have had to have engineers there. We are having a lot of problems, as is our sister company, with particular types of ticket machines at the moment and it's gone to such a high level it's actually at managing director level. So that's being addressed as well. So please trust me on that. And again, I'm very, very happy for you to have my email address during the interval. And I will stay for the interval so you can give me your email address. Okay? Next question, please. I've got Council Sergeant and then You didn't actually talk about part of your brief, which is connectivity with, say, buses. Um, and I've had a complaint from a local resident about the lack of connectivity between Milton Road and the uh, new railway station. Um, I'm pleased to see the N bus stops at Mitcham's Corner, but then there's no other stop for, for the whole length of Milton Road to the, um, to the railway station for that service. Um, are you in discussions with Stagecoach and the County Council on that? Because there's a lot of people who may well be driving to the station now because they can't get the bus um, from Arbury Road Junction um, yes. and other lengths of... Uh, well, the answer is um, yes, because as part of my role, I'm involved in station travel, travel planning. We have regular, regular station travel plan meetings at which Stagecoach are there, um, travel plan plus, plus are there, um, representative cycle forums, etc. What I'd like you to do, um, Councillor Sergeant, is again take my email address at the interval, just give me the specific details, I'll bring it up in the next meeting, because obviously I need to talk to Stagecoach about that, yeah, because connectivity is all important for that station. James? James, sorry. Is this working? Yeah. Sorry, um, thank you for your, your, your feedback. Um, one of the things that has been raised as well, you mentioned that you've been helping um, a lady with a heavy bicycle. Um, the cycle guttering seems to be very poorly fitted and is essentially unusable right now. Uh, what action is being taken to get that fixed? Okay, um, having had that experience myself on Monday morning with a bike, um, I hurried back to the office and fired off a salvo of emails. Um, good news in that that's already been brought up by one of our asset directors. Um, he's in direct liaison with um, Volker Fitzpatrick and Network Rail. And I think I'm not going to stand here and promise you things, but my hope and expectation is that um, something is done about it. The biggest issue for me is that in actual fact it's too near the wall, which makes it very, very difficult to actually push a bike up that channel. So to me, it's not the best design, and as I say, I've made sure that um, our asset management is actually the deputy director of asset management, is fully aware and he's having discussions uh, during the snagging um, uh, arena, if you like, um, into getting that sorted. When will we be able to confirm timelines for getting that fixed? Well, again, um, as, I've say, as I've said already, um, I um, can't, well, I can't give you a timetable, but you can have my email. Okay, I can't give you a timeline at the moment. I, I can, as I say, give you um, my address so that you can contact me. answered about uh, being on a transport planning um, group in terms of connectivity to the station. Um, 
What I'm wondering is what influence you have with Stagecoach, because lots of people have tried to get Stagecoach to improve <laughs> buses and to stop. So it's one thing sitting in a room and saying that, but in terms of practically getting Stagecoach, and Andy Campbell is very you know, upfront about his things, mm. to stop on Hispan Road or to stop down Milton Road and bring people there, where's your cloud? <laughs> Well, it's not a case of the railway over the bus, so I don't lord it over the group, if you like. Um, but I will make sure that when I've had the email details of that, that it's actually brought up. I think probably if Andy Campbell were here, what he may well say is the problem is, and it's much like when we stop a train, every time you stop a bus, it actually increases the journey. I guess that's what he might say. And much like, as I say, every time we stop a train, it means that we've got less track, track capacity, if you like. However, I'm very interested in the comment because, obviously, we want the most superb connectivity for that station. You know, I can't tell you how delighted I was, but I'm, he I'm hearing people say, oh, I've just come from Swavers here, I've just come from St Ives, and I'm going to Stansted Airport. And they say, what would you previously have done? Oh, I'd have probably got a taxi, something like that. That's great. However, we need those buses to stop at key locations. So I'll make sure when Mr. Busman's at that meeting that I've got that email in front of me, I promise you. And similarly, if you've got any other stops, I mean, I, as I say, I can't promise. Um, I, don't, I don't lord it over him. Um, I'm not his boss, um, but I'll make sure it's brought up. Okay? Lovely, thank you. Mr. <clears throat> yeah, I've got a number of uh, comments or questions about teething problems which are at the station, which I expect you're already aware of. Um, shall I do them one by one? Or, yes, uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. yes, and I'll, uh, I'll note them down. <clears throat> the first one is the uh, train doors not opening. Uh, has that been dealt with yet? <laughs> well, if you give me the whole list. Okay, I'll give you the whole list. Yeah. Uh, second one is trains starting too far down the platform from platform three. You've got to walk right the way down the platform. There's no obvious reason why they shouldn't stop. Uh, you know, when it's a short train, it shouldn't stop much further down. Um, lifts you already dealt with. Signage from Fen Road. You've got very good signage within the station, but there's, uh, are you going to put some decent signage from Fen Road uh, saying that there's uh, pointing from Fen Road to the cycle and pedestrian access to the station from there. At the moment it says station, uh, which might think that you could drive there, which of course you can't. Um, shop and cafe, obviously, we'd like to know when those are, when those are going to happen. Um, another question about the ticket machines, uh, and that is there are no shortcuts on the ticket machines. You've got to type in London if you want to go to London, which is pretty tedious. Uh, and I think most of the ticket machines usually have a kind of a, a quick access um, uh, feel there. Timetabling frequency and connections, obviously that one's going to go on for some time as to you know where you can travel to and when and how often. One particular thing that I would just mention is that if you're coming from Cambridge and you miss uh, and you arrive at Cambridge on about a quarter past or whatever it is, you've then got to wait until uh, half an hour basically in order to get to Cambridge North uh, and we found ourselves still picking people up from Cambridge uh, Central uh, rather than waiting for them to get to Cambridge North. Um, disability and blind uh, access. Uh, it's been commented to me that uh, blind people, for blind people it's very bewildering because there's no kind of clues, there's no um, feedback from pavements and things as to where you are. Uh, I, I mean I haven't gone into this but I know that Kale, um, the Cambridge uh, organisation that deals with people with disabilities, basically I know they've been in touch with you yes. about a, a number of issues there. Yeah. Um, and things like curb cuts as well, I noticed there should really be curb access in Moss Bank uh, in order, if you wanted to get up on the pavement there with a wheelchair for example, uh, you can't at, at the moment. Um, and I think um, you have a couple of other things. The level crossing safety improvements. I know there's work happening on the level crossing, the Fen Road level crossing, uh, for those of us who live the other side of the level crossing. Um, there's supposed to be work happening. Can you, tell, can you update us on when that's happening to improve the safety of the level crossing? And finally, 
Uh, well, I've got, I could get, yeah, actually carry on, but there's, I'll, I'll, I'll stop. You can it. always navigate the interval. <laughs> I, I will, yeah. Uh, but there's the level crossing down times for people in Fen Road as well. Uh, we were told that that was going to um, increase a little bit, but I think it's increased quite a lot. Uh, and it's now by no means untypical to have to wait for four trains to go by. And it would be really interesting to know who decides on the blocking and priorities for controlling the uh, priorities of rail versus road. Does road ever take priority? You know, if you've been sitting there for a quarter of an hour, does that then become a priority? Uh, how long does it take for car for uh, trains if they're leaving Cambridge North? How long is the crossing down before uh, trains actually move out? Because I suspect that that's longer than it really need to be. Obviously, you know, safety is clearly paramount for everybody, but uh, one suspects quite strongly that uh, level crossing downtime could be optimised for road and pedestrian and cycle users uh, a lot compared with what's happening at the moment. I'll stop there. Okay, okay. Uh, Alan, we're nearly on the dots. So, right, um, so I've got like max five minutes, I guess, have I? Yeah. If, okay, if, and then you'll have to see me join the interval. Right, okay, um, I'm going to start at the beginning and then work my way uh, back because, natural fact, I've um, uh, I'm fully aware of all of them. Um, not familiar with the last one, but anyway. Right, <clears throat> the train door problem. Um, the train door problem is something called selective door opening. Um, I, I've had it happen to me, so it's happened to me, and I've seen it, and it happened to me the other day. <clears throat> it's mainly happening, as I understand it, to the trains which are operated by Govia Thameslink Railway, the Great Northern Trains. And my belief is that they're working on the problem. I'm not sure where they are with solving or fixing the problem, but they're on it and they're working on it. I can't really say more than that because I don't work for that company. So we're fully aware of it. We're fully aware of the nuisance factor. We don't want it. It's happened to me and yeah, we're, 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 um, we're trying to sort it. The, again, um, people have said to me, why do I have to work, walk halfway to Ely to, to get on a train in Platform 3? Um, well, it's not so bad if there's an 8-coach train in there, and it's not so bad if there's a 12-coach train in there, but as you quite rightly say, it is a pain if there's only a 4-coach train in there. Um, again, it, as I understand it, we're looking at it. Um, it's all to do with the locations of the signalling, the, what's called the berthing of the train, where the signalman can see where the train is, where the signals are located. It's not a simple thing of just like saying, oh, tomorrow we'll move the, plat we'll move the train a bit further down the platform. There are complex operational reasons why what's being done at the moment is done. However, again, to coin a phrase, we're on it and we're seeing what can be done. It involves network rail as well because it's their signalling apparatus, so very much aware of that. Signage, Fen Road, um, I've brought the attention of signing issues on Milton Road and other areas to the attention of the City Council. Um, I had a, the other Tuesday when it was raining hard, um, one of the top men gave me a lift back to the uh, station actually, so I, uh, I bent his ear actually while we were travelling and um, again he's looking at the signage issues. Uh, it's not railway signage. It's, it's signage provided in the community. So, again, that's an issue. But I will take this list away with me to remind those people at the tra next travel planning meeting and see where we are. Because I don't know whether you know, you could probably tell me, has anything been improved on Milton Road yet to tell you where the station is? No. No, okay, right. He's, to he's, to he's told me there are going to be improvements. County Council. Okay, County Council, okay. Right, um, ticket machines, I will... As I say, there are still some issues with that, some glitches. I'll take that one away about the shortcuts. Not quite sure of the answer, but if others can do it, then they can as well. There are, I say, a few glitches still in the system which we're ironing out at the moment. Shop and cafe, I can't give you a date when they're coming. They are coming, the work has actually started to build the, the coffee shop area in the foyer. So that's, uh, that will be the first, I suspect. Um, the timetable. The timetable you've got at the moment is, will exist for some time now. 
Um, it was a timetable that was agreed um, between Govia, Thameslink Railway, Greater Anglia and the Department for Transport and Network Rail based on the line route capacity. Um, however, next May, when the new service starts to Brighton and Gatwick Airport, there will be a lot of changes to the Great Northern timetable, and I'm not sure what they will be, but there will be three services to Maidstone and Brighton and Gatwick from Cambridge, and I guess, I don't know, that some of those may start at Cambridge North, so there will be revisions. We will change the timetable in 19 stroke 20, and at a meeting on Tuesday, I pressed a train plan, as I said, look, we need to improve, maybe even have the two Liverpool Street services starting at Cambridge North, not just the one. So, I, again, we're aware of that, and as I say, people have said to me we'd like more trains, and they're already saying that, but at the moment, with line capacity and what's been agreed, but as I say, in the future, I'm quite sure there will be improvements. Disability and blind people, um, I've taken, um, is it Graham from the Cambridge? Yeah, we had a meeting this week. I invited him to Cambridge North because we had a big meeting at Cambridge Station a few weeks ago, which was very constructive. Took Graham to Cambridge North on Tuesday. He pointed out what you're pointing out. I've raised that at a very high level, and I'm so, I've said, why have we designed that forecourt, that plaza, not taking into account? Yeah, okay. Now, I've actually raised that with none other than the head of safety for Rebellio, actually, and he's saying, yes, this needs to be considered, and these people need to be involved right at the outset. What I can't tell you, I don't know, because I wasn't involved in the construction, I can't tell you whether um, um, disability forums, etc., were involved in the initial planning. I don't know that. But... If they weren't, then it's a lesson learnt, isn't it? Now, last of all, is an unfortunately the one I really can't answer because it's absolutely purely a network rail issue. It's a network rail crossing. I know network rail would like to close a lot of their clock crossings in the future. Whether they've ever, well, I guess they don't, want, I guess you don't want that crossing closed. Whether they do or not, I don't know. But, I, you know, they, I can't answer that question for network rail. I can't answer it, I'm afraid, because I don't know. All I would say is everything is done for safety. So the downtime is safety. The, the time at which the barriers start going down when the train approaching is for safety reasons. You would have to ask network rail that. Okay, I'm five over your break now, so you've got to, you've got to nab me in the break. Thank you very much, and thank you for all your support in making Cambridge North happen. Thank you for all the good you've said about it. You'll be pleased to know that all the things you've brought up are things that we're on and dealing with, basically. So thank you very much, everyone. Okay. Uh... Before we've not got a break yet, we've got another um, briefing of the wider developments in the North area. Paul Mumford. Alan, before you nip off, I'd like to work with you about the disabled parking, those works vans all parking in disabled parking. Now, at the planning, I did ask if the seats could have, some of the seats could have arms for people to be able to push themselves up, and they're, they're still not there. Not but I'll talk to you later. I'm, um, I'm one of the planning officers that uh, Mr. Spencer and uh, your councillors are putting pressure on. <laughs> so much pressure I've come here to make. So, um, and the uh, Cambridge Station, I've been here before and talked about Cambridge Station um, a few months ago. It came through my team at South Cambridge as well. So if there are any residual questions that you've, you've still got, then um, I might be able to put a planning, um, give a planning answer, I suppose. But the main reason for me coming on tonight was to talk a bit about the other um, developments that are proposed or happening or coming through the planning system uh, in the area around the station and then across onto the, the science park. Um, and there's a lot happening or proposed. Um, uh, Katie, who's in the team here, we'll, we'll be meeting with um, Brookgate uh, today um, and we we're starting to think about um, what might happen around the station. Um, the slide we've got here just gives a, a, a bit
bit of an overview. I've added on the right there the um, run up the A10 um, to include Water Beach um, and the site of the Water Beach Barracks, where at uh, South Downs we've got the planning application in um, for six and a half thousand homes. Um, so there'll be a common theme that comes out here about the importance of considering transport implications properly uh, in, through the planning process before you make any decisions. Um, so the site in the north of Water Beach, as you may or may not know, is, is, is to be allocated for a new town through the um, South Cambridge local plan process. Uh, and we have a planning application already for six and a half thousand houses. That will obviously have an impact on Cambridge itself in terms, uh, primarily I think, in terms of transport uh, down the A10. But we're also being quite careful to think about any air quality impacts that might come along uh, on the back of that transport as well. And then the bit of the side on the left, you can see we've um, tried to show where planning consent is in place and construction might be happening, where we've got planning applications um, at the moment, and then where we're in uh, what we call pre-application discussions, so things that are happening that, that, that are due to come along. And I've just got a couple of slides for, to give a kind of a, an idea, particularly of the numbers one to four, um, of uh, pre-application discussions that we're in. Have a, do I need to press it? Okay. Tony, thank you. Thank you. Um, we've heard about from Alan Bat Station, um, so that's obviously open now, and uh, like Alan says, he can take things away, and uh, if there's any planning issues, then please do ask me. Uh, the next slide shows um, something that's up on, um, just on the edge of Milton Road, next to Taylor Vinter's offices, um, that gets referred to as the Toe Site, as part of St John's Innovation um, Park. So, planning permission is now in place, for a new office block which would front right onto Milton Road. So this will be one of the first buildings that you see as you come into Cambridge um, down, down the A10 and Milton Road. Next slide, please. Um, this is a small one and I'll, I'll refer back to the, the, the overview map at, at the end. Um, Mick George, you've got some works, uh, got a site already um, in, in this area and they've applied for uh, an extension basically to that for the next. 10 years to continue continue the works from there. Excellent, Tony. This is um, an office, another office uh, development that's proposed um, just uh, as you go along Cowley Road right to the end and, and turn left into the uh, industrial area. Um, the Coulson scheme. Um, this is with Cambridge City Council, uh, the administrative boundary and it weaves its way through, through the area. Uh, and that's a scheme, as far as I'm aware, is, is likely to be given planning consent um, for, a, for a new office block. Next. Um, that's the site of the old park and ride, I think, which is owned by Cayman City Council. Cayman City Council is preparing to do some works um, on their existing kind of depot site where they store uh, lorries and what have you, uh, are going to use, on a temporary basis, use the old park and ride site to um, just also the lorries while they, while they work on the, uh, the existing depot. So that's things like um, washdown facilities for um, uh, lorries and things that are associated with the city council operations. And then this is one of the um, pre-application discussions that, that we're in. So the land just around Cambridge North Station, um, and in fact as you, as you come out of the station, um, the land between the station building and the car park, um, is the proposal for a hotel going there and then the land just opposite the station across the station square for an office building which is the one down at the bottom right. So these are in pre-application discussions we're expecting a planning application uh, in the next week or so uh, and that's coming through from Brookgate who control the land around Cambridge North Station um, who of course also control the land around Cambridge Station itself um, which you may have seen, I'm not getting the best press at the moment. Um, uh, so that's an application that we're, we're expecting quite soon. We think that's a pretty high quality proposal in terms of hotel and office um, development around Cambridge North Station. And the whole idea there is partly about we now have the station in place, but the land around it's quite bare. 
So bringing some activity and bringing some uses to that land is something that we think is pretty important. Um, and then just one slide at the end about the, um, I mentioned the uh, water we plan yet. Um, we'll be considering this, it will take us about a year to properly consider all of the implications of, um, of putting six and a half thousand homes um, up on that site. But what we do have is some, some of the images that are coming from, from the applicant, which is a company called Urban and Civic. Um, and this is one where you've got the existing lake on the, on the back site, as it is that the engineers built, uh, and an idea to build some uh, kind of apartment blocks along the edge of that lake and to use that lake to bring it into use for um, public use for not just fishing but water sports and what have you. So, so these are the kind of large scale proposals that, that we're considering. They're important in terms of the northern edge of Cambridge, like I said, mainly in relation to transport. Tony, I think the next. The next, yeah. So this is back to the to the um, the first slide that I, I had. Would, what we're finding at the moment is, of course, that the A10 is a very very busy road, uh, and in fact, the level of capacity on that road is almost zero because of, because of the amount of traffic on there. So the, the main thing that we need to think about when we're considering these planning applications and whether or not they should get planning approval uh, is uh, the impacts that they might have in terms of transport, how they could be mitigated and how they might be mitigated and how that relates to the current situation on, on the A10. There's a key piece of work going on at the moment um, called the A10 study, um, which is being uh, commissioned by the County Council but has some of the major developers of uh, the A10, including the Science Park uh, Partnership organisation that, that controls the land around the station, and the Water Beach developers themselves, have contributed into that to fund a piece of work that the County Council have commissioned some consultants to do. And we're really waiting for that uh, to give us an idea of what might happen or what should happen to the A10 before we take any more large scale planning decisions. And in particular for me, that means the one for the uh, remote six and a half thousand homes. But it's also relevant when we're thinking about proposals um, in closer to, to Cambridge on the northern edge, uh, northern end of Milton Road there. Um, the red line, just finally before I stop, the red line is um, denotes an area that we, you know, your councils call Cambridge Northern Fringe East. Uh, and ideas that have been um, are coming through slowly through the planning process about what might happen in that whole area, um, whereby you have a number of landowners, including the, uh, the city council, who, who are all interested in developing that site and making the best use of that site. There are obviously some big challenges associated with that. It's got the Angling Water uh, Sewage Treatment Works, and Angling Water aren't able at the moment to say whether or not definitely they're, they're seeking to relocate those, those works. Um, but very much uh, there's a combined effort going on between South Kansas City, the County Council and, and uh, other landowners and stakeholders to think about what could, could happen there. Um, it's a bit early at this stage to say what that might be, but that's definitely something that we can keep, we can keep um, you updated about and, and your councils are thinking pretty hard about it um, at the moment. same developers who worked on the Cambridge station are going to be work, working uh, that want to, to build something on the, the new Cambridge North station. Given the controversy over the uh, Cambridge development so the 21st century slum was one of the and also there was an expensive tax rate, have you put any extra measures to make sure this kind of problems don't happen again to the Cambridge North? Yeah, um, and the first thing we're doing is, that, is their ideas for what they might do around the Cambridge North are not early early in the process. So what we have the opportunity to do is, is do just that, is to say, look, what's happened at, at CP1? Um, I think understanding exactly what it means, um, I've read a couple of um, newspaper articles now that, 
and the development one is the one that seemed to be the most kind of critical, uh, but there's only um, the independent that seemed to be slightly less critical, if you like. So finding out what exactly what's happened there, and that's largely about addressing what's happened there as well. There's something that we're trying to do with the with Cambridge City Council, who's, who's land that's that's with him. But then you're, you're dead right. I mean, making sure that a if there's anything specific that um, wasn't done that could have been done that we do mm. that. And also just making sure that between the two councils, between South Cambridge and the city, that we really understand what it is that we need to make sure happens before anything um, comes along here. I mean, the first two schemes we've got there, the hotel and the office, have been through uh, uh, quite a strict design review process, and we've got independent advice in terms of are these. Um, Will they meet the task that they're meant to do? Are they high quality design? Do they have good sustainability features? So we're quite confident about those. I think from reading the press, partly the issue about CB1 was the overall management of the overall area. And that's something that we are, you know, right now we're, it's the right time to start talking about those things with, with Brooklyn. So, so yes, certainly take it on board and we'll make sure that it you know, does get addressed. The Water Beach, Water Beach Barracks, uh, Urban Civic, they have quite a good reputation, I think, because they're doing Alconbury Wheel. That seems to be going well. Um, I wondered whether any influence could be brought to bear, though, on the design that they mentioned about the A10 and what possible improvements you might need to cope with extra traffic, whether there could be some really good quality cycle routes from Water Beach through to the centre of town, off-road, in order to encourage people to cycle, who are probably quite willing to cycle that distance if the um, facility is there. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, when we've um, been, we're talking with Urban Civic now, and that's top of our list of things to make sure it does happen, and we've got um, the absolute support from the county council in that as the, as the highest authority. I think any, any development that happens um, up the A10 is, needs to think about non-road use measures first. So cycling, absolutely, potential for bus routes to come from uh, Water Beach, and there's also um, proposals to relocate the current Water Beach station to allow <coughs> that to serve uh, a new town, if that, if that did come forward. So yes, totally agree very much so. It's just a couple of things really. One is that there are already applications coming forward before the master plan, and I think the area action plan has been agreed, um, which never seems good to me. Secondly, I think the comments about Brook Brookley, nothing is, nothing is really wrong with a master plan, you know, the, and the outline things. It's always what happens afterwards, and there are so many uh, developments in Cambridge where that's the case. Everything from the V to, I would say, Orchard Park, which I've been involved in a lot and have a great deal of time for. I mean, I continually, I, I'm not a graffiti person, I would never do it, but every time I drive down the A14 and see that sound barrier, I want to get out and write, South Cambridge did this to Cambridge on it, because it is, it's a damn awful sound barrier, you know, and it makes us look like a gated city. So, and if you look at Orchard Park, a lot of the buildings and the colours that we're all felt there now, you know, actually there's a lot of disrepair on there, you know, they never seem to be done. So it's not about the master plan, it's not about planners talking with developers and putting forward something that, that hopefully will be high quality. It's about the execution, it's about developers getting away with changing that. And that's something I'm, I'm, I'm not sure people have confidence in in that um, the planning framework at the moment is robust enough to allow you to do the job and get the really good plans that, that I'm sure you want. So that's the conversation to have with Brookdale. Not well, how do you see it now, but how are you going to guarantee you are not going to change this and cheapen this and take out all the things that, you know, actually we all want to have happen because Frankly, you know, I, I love planning and I don't trust the developer as far as I can throw it. It's a couple of bits on. One, you've got to learn from, learn from your mistakes. So you mentioned Orchard Park and, and looking at it, there's a, a 
piece of work that's gone through South Cambridgeshire District Council in terms of the councillors who were involved with that, uh, set themselves up with a task group and scrutinised what happened. And we've now got, yeah, there you go. So 20 or so recommendations came out from that, which we're now making sure that we, not just as planners, but as you know, across the whole council, uh, and, and in terms of the county council, so you've got to learn from it. But I think you're right, you know, the, the planning system allows for changes to be sought by a developer for good reason. One of the things that we do, I think we do pretty well in Cambridge and South Cambridge is, is use our planning committees. So there's, a, there's always a point where as a planning officer you can say, um, yes, you can ask for that change, but what I'm going to do is take that through uh, a much more kind of accountable decision-making process than just allowing a, a, a planning officer to do that. And I think that's, and again, one thing we've learned is that actually sometimes making that position clear to the developer can make them think a bit more clearly and carefully about the changes that they want to pursue. So yeah, I do again, take those points on board. You know, we'll try, we'll keep trying, we'll, we'll keep you updated as to how we're, how we're getting on with it, I suppose. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. Uh, we're really running behind now, so if you've got any other questions, can I, will you be here for about another 10 minutes, Paul? Uh, yeah, I'll do yeah. 10 minutes, yeah. yeah. Okay, lovely. <laughs> if anybody wants to ask Paul any questions, perhaps they could go up. For, uh, we're now going to stop for about 10 minutes. <laughs> we'll, we'll stop for 10 minutes um, and then um, we'll get on to the police. Alright, thank you very much. Okay, everybody, thank you very much. Um, we haven't got into um, King Kelly here, but we've got Louise Waldo, who's going to speak up on, on the issues. Um, you will start to see in your pack uh, the current uh, priorities that were set. Um, and um, would you like me to go through all the issues, or would you like to just go straight in? I think Kelly says yours is as well. I can do the report, and then okay. I'm going to talk through each of the proposed. Okay, fantastic. I have, I have had some conversations okay. with. Um, Okay, so do you want to start with the first thing? Well, Lynn can go first. Oh. <laughs> so, yeah, so I'm just uh, reporting back on Avery Street uh, and Darwin Drive because that was one of the priorities from last time. Um, we've done quite a lot of work um, with regards to working with residents, obviously working with the police. We've had the redeployable camera now in um, since that went back um, in last November time, uh, October time. Um, that has, I think, been having a, a, a great effect. Um, police have also been doing some very, very proactive work uh, in the area, working with door knocks, uh, working with residents, obviously, working with the councillors as well, um, and things are really quieting down. Um, so we're at the stage now where we are obviously continuing to monitor it. The redeployable camera um, has now been in for um, eight months, so we're actually now looking at removing it. That doesn't mean that it won't be able to be put back in uh, again in the future if there are further um, incidents. We are also looking at a possibility of um, possibly getting a, a, a permanent camera there, but again, we'll be working with the police, with the councillors and the residents with regards to that. Thank you, for, thank you very much for that. Um, Kevin, could I... <coughs> I did promise councillor who's not here that I would give my report in the uh, manner of interpretive dance. As they've not turned up, I'm not going to bother. Uh, but I am going to wander around because I was on holiday until Tuesday and I right, haven't had enough sleep, so I don't want to pause. <laughs> so there were two further ones. Obviously we worked with um, the annotation behaviour team with the first one. They, so the next one was um, the speeding and dangerous driving on Fen Road. Um, this work has been undertaken by both my team, which is the North Park Prevention Team, which have been carrying out targeted patrols in the area to provide a high profile presence, both preventing zero defence under the Road Traffic Act. Give me a road a long time ago and I can't remember it. Um, as well as the work that's undertaken by the team, there's also been support by the departments with that, so within the force, which is one of the advantages of a, a big, a, a, an item being adopted here, it gives us the opportunity to make bids to other parts of the staff to get help. Um, we had patrols that were carried out by a road policing unit, 
um, which have directly dealt with a number of issues in the area, and also we've had significant support from our special constabulary, which have been really very positive um, in terms of them going out and uh, addressing the issues at Sydney. Um, as well as that, we've been doing some more engagement work around the uh, area of Fen Road, which is happening um, not only in the city, but with kind of decision was taken by the, uh, the senior management team of the for the, uh, the policing in the city that we were going to go and start looking across what goes on past the, past the railway bridge essentially mm. and just see if we could actually learn some, learn what's going on and have an understanding of what's going on there and then maybe point out what was going on. So um, one of my PCs from my team and one of the PCs from my prevention team have been doing some fairly depth engagement work across, the, across there so uh, hopefully I'll start to bear a little bit of fruit. Um, the current situation is, as I'm sure the council better can tell me better than I can tell you, it's still ongoing. I think realistically this is going to be something that sits on the work that we do probably between now and when I retire. Which, uh, I just got my pension state today, so when I work out how to log into it, I'll work out how long that's going to be. Um, the, the third priority was antisocial cycling on the pavements. Um, and this has basically been worked been undertaken by my PCSOs. Um, we have a weekly meeting and they're reporting back to us, that we're reporting back to me at that meeting that they are routinely out there, they're routinely challenging people who are on bikes. Um, from our experiences, it tends to be happening around school, a lot of it tends to happen outside schools. So potentially there's some work here in the future around addressing the school, or doing, speaking to the schools around that. But like I say, Um, that's, that's the work that's been carried out mainly by the PCSOs and our team. Um, and then if you look on the back of the page 43, it talks around the, um, what are they called, the priorities coming for the next, next month, the next uh, six months, isn't it? Um, it's slightly different to how it's been done before. Basically what we've done is myself and the, and the North team have sat down and said actually what, what are the issues that we're aware of that potentially we can do extra work. And I think the key thing to think of there is extra work above and, above and beyond what our normal day to day work is on those areas. There are six potential priorities here um, and potentially what we could do to address those issues. We have the resource and the facility to take three of them. So my question to you will be, which of those three does the committee believe are the most appropriate that we take or that you would like us to look at? Um, I will go through the six that are on there. Um, first one is combating county lines of drug dealing. Local policing resources tackling serious and organ is, is responsible for tackling serious and organised crime. This is prioritised by working in partnership to highlight and safeguard people who are vulnerable, maybe taking advantage of in this matter. County lines drug dealing is about people turning up to vulnerable people's houses and basically setting up business there and selling class A drugs in their dress. Our work around here is based on vulnerability, it's based around safeguarding one, the people who are at the address, and two, the, the criminality that, um, that goes with that. And the resources will also be used to specifically target the criminal criminality associated with drug dealing gangs and the multiple threats they offer. Um, Sergeant Street, who is the um, one of the sergeants in our prevention team, spends a lot of time actively engaging with these these aspects of the community. <coughs> so he and his team, I think it would be fair to say, have at least reading his email. No, he's not. It would be fair to say that they have a lot of success in dealing with that. This would basically give us the opportunity to work with the people who are at risk and to actively target the people who are breaking the law. The next one is child sexual exploitation. Um, what's important to look at with um, child sexual exploitation is everybody has a view of what they think it is. Um, and not mean to be horrible, people think it's tax drives taking advantage of young girls or young boys, and it isn't. There are several models of child sexual exploitation and the one that is generally most relevant to the city is about people having inappropriate, they talk about inappropriate boyfriends or girlfriends. Um, 
there's some in, quite in, really quite interesting research which talks around professionals should talk about a 13-year-old girl having a 21-year-old boyfriend, which talk about someone being abused who's 30 by somebody who's 21. Um, so inappropriate boyfriends and, or inappropriate sexual relationships along those lines are one of the major tasks that we look at in child sector child sexual exploitation. There are issues in the Northern City and there, are, there is a considerable amount of work that's done essentially by a, a team called the Operation Make Safe Team which engages with all of the victims who are highlighted but there is work that we can potentially take on this extra. Um, it would be around safeguarding, it would be around targeting when potential vulnerabilities are. So the classic example it would be patrols outside of schools to see if little Johnny is getting in a car with a considerably after man or woman. Um, it would be a work around that. Um, that's not to say, please don't say the answer, it's right and it's going on hundreds of times across the city. They are potentially high harm offences that if you get somebody who's involved in that, it's potentially life altering. So I feel it's, it's essentially a very relevant and very useful piece of work we can do. Again, the next one is the antisocial behaviour around Fenro. If you notice it's worded around antisocial behaviour in general rather than particularly around driving, I think there are issues. I'm sure I read a report recently today, or certainly about people, things being framed from cars. Which is, as, as, as I view it, is just antisocial behaviour. It just happens to have a car involved in it. Um, it's slightly broader than looking at the traffic issues. It just it, it frees our hands slightly in terms of what, what tactics we can employ. So, again, that's the next one. Um, theft from motor vehicle. If you look at the um, if you look at the figures, which did, there's a spike. There's been a spike in theft from motor vehicles. It's mostly around builders' vans. Um, quite possibly linked to the amount of building work that's going on. So, again, that is potentially an option. Um, the summer is coming, um, and again, the summer uh, leads to increased antisocial behaviour in green spaces. Um, I'm in the process of writing the West, same for the West Central Committee, and again, this is a suggestion I'm making to the city centre. There are the increased number of people there are using those spaces leads to increased antisocial behaviour. So, again, that would be. Right, that will help us focus any patrol work we did around those areas. And finally, it's um, road safety. Um, road safety says road safety, so can't be saying nothing about that. Questions? Okay, nothing. Thank you very much. I'll just have um, a couple myself and then I'll go up to one of my cows and I'd like to chat to you about it. Um, first of all, is the. Um, child sex exploitation. Yeah. Um, you, you say that um, it's going on in the north of the city. <coughs> it, is, is it a lot or is it sort of, can you sort of give us a, an idea how much is going on there? And then also the antisocial behaviour uh, around Fen Road. We did have a meeting with you, myself yes. and uh, Councillor Abbott, Chief Inspector, yeah. um, and we're just wondering any idea if we'll be able to get a CCTV camera feedback from there. Um, the CSE stuff is reviewed. I, I sit on a monthly meeting which it's um, run from um, essentially at Make Safe, so there's a Make Safe meeting I go to this next week. So we, we sit there. Um, in terms of numbers, it will probably be either it would either be wrong or irresponsible to sit here and put a number on it. Because the, pro the problem is, I think at times, there's, there's, there's two risks. We're either unsighted on it or it's not happening. And I think I don't want to be unsighted on it as an issue. We, we work with the schools, we work with social care, we work with a lot of people to highlight people who are potentially at risk. And then a lot of work needs to go into those people to kind of and that is done by our main safety team, which is made up of police officers, social workers and everything. So it sits there. It, that just is a priority would strengthen <coughs> our arm to go out there and sort of say, OK, we think it might be happening in this area. We'll go to this area. We think it might be happening outside this college. We'll go to this college. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Fen Road? Yeah. The meeting we had with we you. We did. We um, spoke about CCTV. Mm -hmm. 
She's in charge of CCTV. So. Yeah, so, with regards to the CCTV, now our team are now responsible for the company administration for the redeployable cameras. So, all we need is um, information, supporting evidence for it, and we can go and have a look at that. We'll, we'll work with the um, CCTV manager. So, we'll have a chat afterwards. Okay, I've got uh, Councillor Yeah, This is not a friendly question. Um, obviously, we have a lot of problems at the moment uh, with crime in the northern area, in East Chesterton. We've had uh, high-profile uh, cases of um, vandalism, arson, then the break-ins and so on. And I appreciate the police are very busy. Um, but I do think that something needs to be done to improve, as a matter of urgency, police communications with the public. And the one thing I think that really undermines public faith in the police is poor communication on the part of the police and the sense that conveys to the public that their issues are not being taken seriously. I was speaking to some residents... I have a feeling you've got specific... Yeah, well, I was speaking to some residents this weekend, for example, to do with... Uh, Petty crime, uh, car break-ins and so on, uh, near the Elizabeth Way at the end of the ward, and uh, emails and messages that they say they've left for the North Area Police that haven't been responded to. I know myself, I uh, uh, tried contacting the police in April with respect to a high-profile case of vandalism in the ward, received a great deal of publicity, where a member of the public came to me uh, with some evidence, well, some, some information that I thought would be useful to the police, given the police had told the Cambridge News they were investigating the case. I couldn't get anybody to answer the telephone, and so I emailed the email address which the Cambridge North Police advertises to the public. Mm -hmm. I sent that email on the 6th of April. I said I was a ward councillor, I gave my telephone number, I said I had information that might be useful to the police in this matter. Not a single person got back to me. Now, what was the email you used? Uh, the one advertised on the website, the one getting CB City North. And that shouldn't be out. Well, it's not using that. Oh, right. If you could tell me where that is, that should be Well, okay, but it shouldn't be advertised to the public, should it? I mean, once that, again, that, that's yeah. what I just said yeah. to you. If yeah. you could tell me where it yeah. is, I would ensure it's taken right, well, down. Well, 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 I'd just like to say... Uh, well, um, no, 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 I'd like to finish my point, please. I'm an I'm elected representative of the public. Thank you. I have had other members of the public complaining about this, and frankly, look, even if people are putting up website uh, email addresses that are wrong, that is not good enough. It undermines uh, faith in policing, and it isn't good enough. Um, you, I, I, I have no doubt that that's wrong. I have no, I'm unsure why that email is still out there. Um, there is ways by... I also raised it on Twitter, so I hope I get a response. There are ways by the force website to contact us. I believe one of my police associates has been tasked to contact you. Did you get contact? No. Okay, if you can give me your email before we leave today, I'll make sure that he gets in contact with you. Councillor's email is quite easily available. Yeah, um, I, unfortunately, things I just said aren't always recorded as they should be. It's slightly... Go on. Oh. I, I was going to say something first, right? Um, it's somewhat frustrating that that's happened, and I don't doubt that. However, there are ways of getting to this from the FORCE website. As an example of the gentleman at the back there is an email that you click on the webcom part, it goes into our web communications page and eventually it drops back down to the right the most appropriate thing. You can go onto the FORCE website. The FORCE website has a photograph of every single member of the North team. I know because mine unfortunately is on there. And you click on my face and it will send me a message. I've now got um, Doug White, Mike, Councillor Sargent, then Councillor Austin, and then Councillor Michael Jones. So, Doug. Um, I've, I've recently contacted my three um, city councillors, so they're aware of what I'm about to say. I've also spoken to the police, and they've been very cooperative to me. Uh, we acted within 16 hours, I think. Um, they even phoned me as well uh, yesterday and spoke to me about it. It's the concern over the increase in the last few months of the racing along King's Hedges Road. Um, it's happening Friday, Saturday and Sunday on a regular basis now. Um, I'm hearing the high performance cars so loud 
but they won't be up at the Hunt Swan in the morning, it was out five days ago, um, revving their engine as they're going along. Um, they, are, they, they ask me to get the registration numbers and things, how can I do that when I'm in bed when this happens, or I'm watching TV at 10 o'clock, because it starts around 10 and ends roughly around 4 or 5. Um, it's not constant, it's periodic. Um, also, I'd like to suggest, both to councillors and police or whoever's concerned, that we've had it for years, but it's just ludicrous to me, with the increase in traffic and the mentality of some of the uh, car drivers, as you come off the A14 from Eastern Road, um, you get the traffic lights and there's two lanes. And it's uh, on the right hand side, you've got about, I'd say 50 metres, 60 at the most, and it encourages somebody to increase their speed to get in front of me. And it's one lane, just as you go across the traffic lights. Now there's an island there, or a piece of concrete, that you could get rid of that lane, that little filter lane, that only lasts about 60 metres. Whenever I saw it years ago, it seemed ludicrous, but now the increase in racing and traffic generally on King's Hedges Road, um, I really do feel that it's, it's an issue that needs to be sorted. They use it as a racetrack because there are no speed cameras, there is no police, there, because the police, I think, are overstretched, as we all are aware. Um, and as it's periodic, you're not going to sit a panda car there for three hours when they need it in the town centre. Thank you. I, I, right, it, 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 it's unfortunately about being in the right place at the right time. And that is something, as you have described, perhaps sporadically, can be challenging. I would say that is, if you tell us, we know. <laughs> when I finish having a conversation at the end, we can, we can have another one. Phoning 101 tells us, it allows us to build a picture and it allows us to work out if it's happening at the same time every week, potentially allows me to deploy the relevant resources to deal with it. If, you, if it's one of those things, if you sit, if you could sit, I could sit there and say, there, Wally driving up and down there at 8.30 every Thursday afternoon or every Thursday evening, I can make a relevant application to the relevant people to get that support as evidenced by the stuff on the front road. That's the kind of thing our road policing unit would be happily to go and put a car sitting up there if you can highlight when it's happening, if you can make it a, a, a relevant time. So, thankful to one and one is tell us what's going on. And it might be the case that actually there was a car sitting on the north of the city going from a job to going somewhere else and you can put them into the right thing. So, it's challenging, it's not impossible, just cool. And could we do something about that um, that was set by traffic lights? Right. Right. That's good? outside my that's outside of my gift. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Sargent. I'd like to back up what uh, Councillor Saris said. Um, I also use what I thought was a police website and clicked on a link to send an email. After clicking on the links for the various police officers on that page, um, which failed, and it was two weeks ago and I had nothing back. So there's obviously a, a major problem with um, getting details as to how to communicate with you. Um, I hope there aren't too many residents out there who are frustrated. Um, but my most ge more general point is around the establishing of uh, police priorities. Because it, it always felt in the past that um, councillors would be bringing issues to the police um, and uh, highlighting them in terms of priorities. Um, so that's certainly why I brought the issue of um, cycling on the pavement, because that is one of the top two issues that's raised in my area. Um, there seems to be a change in the way that uh, it's now being managed, that we're given, a, uh, given six items to pick from, rather than us reflecting what we are being told on the doorstep. Um, and uh, I'm not quite sure why this is coming about. Um, you know, I, I think we need to look seriously at, um, at this. Some of the items on here um, feel as though they are general police priorities across the city and uh, the police are trying to uh, get us to come up with prioritising those locally. Uh, you've already used the example of the antisocial behaviour and green spaces 
um, on, that you're also going to take to West Central Area Committee, and I'd like to hear from you as to um, whether you see in future us just voting for a list or carrying on with reflecting the priorities that we're picking up from our local residents. I think, to me, the relevance is I sit here once every six months. To wait for six months to hear about an issue, essentially look to address it, is too long. To wait and sit there, the, 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 the priorities that were written and were forwarded on to you came from the team. They weren't randomly picked from what was going on, they came from speaking to the officers of the PTSA to work for me and working out what we are being told from calls that the public are making to the police, to the relevant contact that we are having about what the concerns are, what the risks are that sit in the police. So, Chair, as a point of information, I'd like to point out I've just gone to the Cambridge uh, North Policing Team website mm -hmm. and exactly the email address I've used cbcitynorth.mpt at cams.pnn.police.uk is the one that's on the website to the public now. I'll take my word. I'll, I'll, I'll look into that. But that. That hasn't been monitored for some time. I don't know what's going on. So what is it? Is it worth giving them the is There is a contact us button on the website, which is the most appropriate way to do it. Why don't you give them your contact number? Because the most appropriate way is the councillors of all my the majority have got my email address mm -hmm. and I have regular contact from several members. Um, if that's on there, I'll answer what is. My concern is I don't want to wait for six months <coughs> to look at something and say this has been a problem for six months. Mm -hmm. I would like to think. Yeah, I just want to come back because, I mean, I assume then you're saying that all of these issues have come up in the last month from what you're suggesting. Or They've come up over the last, of, the last period when we yeah, discussed so, it. So you've been waiting for six months for us to prioritise them by the sound of it. It's the same argument, I'm afraid. Um, it's not the same argument and, because uh, I understand what my office is doing on a daily basis. To, we need to decide whether it's the committee's role to raise issues which we think need to be prioritised or it's for you to come up with a list, a shopping list that we pick from, and that's what the committee needs to decide. Well, the deciding, at the end of the day, I am giving you the experience of my team mm -hmm. and my knowledge of what's going on in the north of the city, and I am saying to you the things that I believe are the most concerning issues that sit on the north of the city at the moment. Okay, thanks. Um, Councillor Austin. So if, just before I ask my question, just picking up on what was said before, um, it's, I mean, I, I do take your point, um, but it would be really interesting if we could get an idea of the inquiries that come from the public to you and why these have come from that. So, you know, we, we, we hear um, from, our, from our residents, but if we hear that what we're hearing is from certain residents, but actually the things you're hearing are different, we actually have quite valuable information to know that. I mean, it, that, that would be quite challenging because we, we receive seven, eight hundred calls a day across the entire course. Probably thirty or forty of those would refer to North of the City on an every, on an everyday basis. Well if you can just take that away as a thought, I think it, it would be very if we could somehow find a way of doing that. I don't anticipate being done immediately, but you know, it'd be quite useful. Um, just what I wanted to, to move on to is um, just a really question. Uh, there seems to have been, over the last 10 days or so, I've been made aware of six people who've had their bikes stolen in the centre of Cambridge. Um, and the reason that they've told me is they've actually had problems in, in reporting it and getting it through. One was on a Saturday night when you may have had a particular problem, um, but they couldn't get through. But um, the question that came back was that they were being asked if there was CCTV near where the bikes had been stolen. 
And one of the calls was saying to me, how do I know if there's CCTV there or not? And the police didn't seem to know where CCTV was placed. Um, do you have CCTV mapped across the city? And do you really need to ask people if you've had some homes stolen whether CCTV... It's not an unreasonable question to ask a person because you, when your bike was stolen, you could have looked up and gone, oh, wait a minute, there's a camera there. That those calls are taken and are dealt with centrally and are not necessarily dealt with by officers that are in the city. That investigation gets screened in, potentially screened into our crime management, our, our uh, volume crime team, who then have the local knowledge of where the cameras are, etc. And then, to, depending on the time frame of the offence and other such things, it is then potentially would be one of my team that would go out and review that CCTV. Right. So, it's, somebody was also told they wouldn't have time to look at the CCTV. It depends on how long. So um, it's just. So the clarity of that situation is what we then say to people when we get the inquiries, I think would be really, really valuable. It's, it's report your bike stolen. It's phone 101, report your bike stolen. And then it will be investigated as the evidence dictates. There, is, there are policies around our ability to review CCTV. If your bike's been there for 15 hours, we're not going to watch with it on CCTV. It's, it's not a, an appropriate use of our resources. The answer would be when people say they've had a they are a victim of a crime is they phone 101 and they tell us and then we investigate. Okay. Um, and then the third point is that doesn't seem totally satisfactory, but I'm well, on now. I'm intrigued as to what else I can tell you. It's the, if you're so, a victim of a crime in Cambridgeshire, you phone 999 if it's happening and there's a risk at that point. If it's not, you phone 101. The report is taken by the handler there, you know, depending on what it is, it is allocated to the relevant investigator. That, there is no other message to give for that. There is no other way to report crime in the city other than Sorry, I'm, um, I'm the Arnie Skipper, I'm uh, responsible for a large amount of cameras. Would you mind the mic? Yeah, if you can't yeah. hear me, I'll let yeah. you talk in the that'd mic. that'd be great. Thank you. Sorry, what was your name again? I'm D.I. Nick Skipworth. I, um, I cover Cambridge City from an investigations point of view and also from a community point of view. Uh, just to pick up on your, on your question regarding uh, somebody reporting a bike theft. So the question around is there CCTV? If I had my bike stolen from, say, Hobson Street, um, the operator will need to know exactly where on Hobson Street that was. Because different parts of Hobson Street will be covered by different CCTV, both private and city council. Obviously we do know where the city CCTV is, but it could be that's covered by a shop locally, etc. So we would ask that question and it'd be right that we did ask that question. Regarding Kevin's point about how many hours the bike's been left there, um, we cannot investigate crime where there may be a slim possibility of catching an offender which may have been caught in something. If the time scale we need to investigate is disproportionate to the type of crime we're looking at. We're in a really difficult position, and I think it's nationwide, I don't even really speak for Cambridge. Um, we're in a really difficult position in that we do not have the resources to deal with everything. Things drop off. What we do have in the local policing team is we have a small group of dedicated officers, and that is a very small group of dedicated officers who can, above and beyond what they're called to do on a daily basis, which is investigate crime in the north of the city, attend incidents in the north of the city, and deal with them, when you do get through to us, and I appreciate there's obviously been a real problem there which we need to look into, deal with um, complaints from members of the public, and deal with calls from the public, etc. When we do have free time, it's limited, we need to prioritise it. And we need a way to prioritise it. Now we have overarching themes which uh, govern the way Cambridge Police do their business, and there'll always be some crime which is always going to be higher priority than other areas. However, the Cambridge City North Community Team is there to try to specifically address community needs. So what we seek is, we seek a definitive, short list of areas you want us to prioritise. By having that short list, it gives us the opportunity to have a meaningful effect on those areas. If we have 12, 15 different areas, we're going to be doing any of it. We're not going to get any meaningful work from any of it, and it's as simple as that. So by giving you this list, is the professional judgment of the officers who, for a living, spend day after day within the north area of the city, doing their best to police that area and we're saying to you we think these areas pose a risk we would like to target some of those areas but we would like you to decide on which area you want us to target 
I'm happy to answer any questions around any of those areas. We go into significant detail. Obviously, with the child sex exploitation, there's obviously some elements I wouldn't want to discuss. Um, that said, I would like to reiterate this isn't a big problem, but it's a high harm problem. So, there's an opportunity really for you to drill into the detail. I'm very happy to answer any questions that you've got for me about any of those areas um, and prioritise what you want that very small team of community officers to look at. And that will then take us forward for the next few months. Because you can't solve a problem in a few days, you can't even solve it in a few weeks sometimes. We talk about the King's Edge's speed of vehicles, we've had numerous reports of that. We've got car crews which has been um, trying to form and people have been meeting um, on Kirkwood Road on a regular basis. And that's why we've got the speed of vehicles. Um, it, it, we can't just solve that overnight. And if they're meeting at 2 in the morning on a Saturday, for example, police resources are ridiculously stretched at those times of day. So we have to be responsive as we can. And what Kevin would then do, if that was, for example, road safety was a priority, for example, and we were looking at that as one of the road safety issues, Kevin would be swapping people shifts, changing their duties, telling them to work at different hours of the day, specifically to target that. So that's why we're giving you the option, really, to, to make the decisions on that. I'll take on board what you say about you would like to have an earlier consultation around that, and um, I've uh, certainly spoken to all my neighbourhood sergeants, and I'll I'll push this back to you as well. I think probably some of you have already had this insight, but I have a community meeting once a week. I hold my sergeants to account every week as to how they're delivering against neighbourhood priorities. And I've invited every councillor in the city to come to that meeting as an open door meeting. Um, uh, one or two, two have already uh, taken that, me up on that. It's been several months since, um, since anyone's been there, but as councillors, you're all welcome to attend that meeting. I can't accommodate you all at once, Anytime you want to drop in and see what we're talking about week on week, you're very, very welcome. And I think it's important that in that meeting I do hold my team to account on your priorities. And so that's important for me as well. So you come along, see us, see me holding them to account, and see them delivering week by week on those priorities. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, I'm going to ask Kevin to come back up. Um, okay, um, I've now got. Um, <coughs> Councillor Mike Todd Jones, um, Councillor Scott, Claire, um, Councillor Gawthrop, Councillor Smart, and then I've got Richard Taylor. So we'll start with Jerry Todd Jones. Jerry, I just finished. Oh, sorry. Wasn't sorry. 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 Um, <coughs> it was an issue about the um, child exploitation, which I think is a really important one. Um, does it, uh, you talked about checking outside schools for people, um, does it include internet exploitation as well? There is certainly an element of in online grooming that takes place, it's, but there are, that is a lot harder to place in terms of resource that I have available to me. So I think what you would do is it's about understanding a whole problem, it's understanding that if Billy walks out of school and gets into a car with a 45 year old bloke, you kind of sit there and go, actually, wait a minute, this is a piece of information that drops into it. That was for my whole picture. Okay, thank you. Oh, look, sorry, um, I forgot a list as well, it was on my list. Okay, so I've got Mike Todd Jones now. <coughs> yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, just a comment really on, on how, how to find on the discussion. Um, I want to know whether something specific with the news, but that, that can wait till I think uh, outside the meeting. But, um, but it's, it's about, it's kind of about the police communication relating to the recommendation soon. But and I take on board all the points that we've made about the public contact or the, or the communication with the police. And obviously there are some issues there to be sorted out about the website and the way the public uh, communicate with the police. But, but on, as far as council is concerned, um, I've had a kind of discussion um, by email with Kevin and with Nick about what, what I consider to be the way forward given the, sort of the change of approach in terms of proposing six recommendations which we then pick from. Um, and I take on board the, the, the point about the six month gap between North Area Committee in terms of the police report and priorities coming forward. But what I, what I am keen on seeing is that as councillors and we contact you through our Council way we can contact you. I mean, I have a great relationship with uh, RBP SOs, uh, with Jason Rago, and now with you, Kevin, about um, picking up issues from local residents in RB and reflecting them to you. And then my expectation then is that those um, priorities or the concerns residents are raising 
uh, are reflected in pre priorities that do come forward in North area. So I think that's a really important element. And it may not be that you're not, that you're, I'm sure you're fully aware of all the issues. It's, it's the question is about where residents and the councillors see the priorities to be. Uh, and I think it's important that that option is retained. And if, if we as councillors, having flagged that up between meetings, so it's not like it's, yeah. you know, it's not really, really being addressed, there might be measures already put in place, but that that then reflected as a, an option uh, we have to six, six recommendations, we would, we would still pick three, uh, including those that the police are suggesting, but if we want to bring something forward and as a priority, um, then I think that, personally, I think that's really important that it's still an option. I think that's important from residents' point of view as much as council's point of view, because we're trying to reflect what those residents are saying. But th th those are my views already um, expressed in a way, through my email to you and Nick, about how I see the recommendations going forward. Um, so, I hope that's a reasonable way of putting it, and hopefully that can be reflected in the way we take this forward in the future. Absolutely, I think we, um, you know, it's, it's a new process, and it's, a, it's an important process because I didn't want, I want you to have a choice. I want you to really inform us. So absolutely, if there's, if there's stuff specifically you want to bring to the table, that's fine. All I'd say is maybe we can help by researching some of those issues beforehand to add a little bit of empirical evidence to what we're talking about. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you. I, I've actually got three um, matters. Um, first of all, I actually have to say thank you very much to Sergeant Music because I've emailed you on a number of occasions and I've had immediate responses, I have to say. Um, one was in, in the very issues too, one was in relation to the zigzag lines at Mayfield School that somebody had told me people were parking on and you responded immediately the next day I got copied into an email that was headed to Jenks and you'd sent the email to your people to ask them to go out and, and patrol. So that, that's one. And this links with my, my question which is about the road safety because um, you also responded immediately when I emailed about the speeding on Arbury Road and Gilbert Road and the cycles and so on. My question here is, what work then would be undertaken for road safety? Because I understand you don't look at the speeding issue, that's the speed watch issue. So what are the offences that you're going to be looking at um, to prevent and detect you know, under the road safety rubric? As, as we said earlier, I have been. If you look at Fen Road as the example, it allows us the ability to go and be the resources that sit outside the, the, the team that I work for. It shows to when you sit there and it shows to the, the wider constabulary that actually this is a local issue, I need your help. And so potentially it would revolve around bidding for road policing and resources. So, and it, 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 so if you, if, a road safety is more than, than simply speaking. And so it gives, uh, gives me the opportunity to make an application to our road policing unit, gives me the opportunity potentially to start looking at safety camera vans, it gives me the opportunity to sit there and say, what else can I draw in to assist my team? And also in terms of road safety could be even as much as stopping kids running out in front of school, primary schools. It could be parking outside on zigzag lines. It could be, it's quite a broad subject. And so it gives you the opportunity to sit there and say, actually, yeah, this week, and as the inspector rightly says, he asks, I have a meeting before, we have, we have a meeting with my team, and the question is, what have you done about priorities like this, 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 what have you done this week? So they are, again, as I am rightly challenged by the inspector, my staff are challenged by me. So you would be sitting there saying to them, road safety is our priority, this is, what have you done? Towards the process of the so it could well be actually I spent an hour and a half over the week outside and they could probably I spent an hour making sure people have put their seatbelts on as they drove out of North Cambridge Academy. I stood at a junction and made sure people didn't jump their bikes. There's lots of various pieces of work that can be done. It's just quite a broad subject matter. Yeah. And it's then it's getting the resources to do that right. Now my second, my, um, the second and third question come under one heading in a sense. It's recently been reported, in fact I think in the paper today or yesterday, yesterday that 7,000 um, 
offences that have somehow been lodged with the police have actually not been recorded. This is the inspectorate has actually said this and is, um, as it appeared to me, um, highly critical of Cambridge Shire Police on this basis. And a lot of those offences are child sexual abuse offences that have somehow not been recorded. Um, I, I, I honestly don't know about that. Right. It, would be, it would be wrong with me to make, have a, a, a positive I, I don't know about specifically child sexual exploitation offences uh, as part of that recording. Uh, <coughs> I think. This is from the inspector. Yeah, the, uh, the HMIC uh, yeah. has a report around uh, home child recording standards. Yeah. So um, you'll see uh, Cambridge is looking at about a 19% increase in recorded crime. And this is largely down to the um, scrutiny around how we record the crime. And the, moving well away from child sexual exploitation, because I think you know, we are, when we, when we see that, we pick up on it. And there is a whole lot of stuff going on centrally, which obviously you imagine I can't kind of prioritise. Um, it's the lower level stuff we're seeing a massive increase in. So, for example, if um, it's CCTV reported on a Saturday night that um, a couple of people are pushing each other in the street, Police turn up, nobody talks to us, there's no evidence of any crime occurred by the officers. Um, once upon a time, we'd have not raised any paperwork and continued our routine patrols. Uh, now we don't do that. We will raise a crime report for a public order event without any suspect or victim and record um, that statistic on a paper crime which they put into the system. So, um, what the HMIC is reporting, and I think the figures they've used are the 86% figures going back a few months several months in fact, I think, and I, might, I might be wrong, so I might be speaking out of terms, I haven't read the full report. Um, however, I do know that our um, crime has increased significantly and reporting has gone up quite a lot tomorrow. Um, so we are tackling that. Um, we, I think our aim is to be above 97% of um, reported crime. And, and traditionally there has been a lot of, um, like I say, crime which hasn't reached the crime system, it's been reported by people but hasn't been raised, and that is typically the crime where we don't find it occurring but it has to be reported so we'll now raise it. Uh, it. It definitely did mention child sexual abuse, child sexual abuse, but <coughs> I, I want to then um, address this one on child sexual exploitation because I agree with the concerns that have been um, raised here and um, it, it, the concern that we had in discussion about this as councillors is that if it's a Cambridge-wide matter then um, some councillors had reservations about it, but you, you are saying it is definitely, and I can't see why it wouldn't be a problem, as a matter of fact, in this area, but you're saying that it definitely is a problem. And if it were prioritised, then again, what resources would you be able to call upon that were specifically directed towards this issue? So, um as Kevin's alluded to, the operation Make Safe, we have a child sexual exploitation team which covers sports wide. We work with a lot of other services and we have a lot of intelligence monitoring which is focused on picking up anybody who's abusing children. As you can imagine, it's always going to be a priority to the police. Um, as part of the work we do with Make Safe, we have seen a trend of increasing reports, uh, singular reports, not, we're not talking paedophile rings or anything horrendous like that, but we are seeing an increase in reports, predominantly for Cambridge, the north of the city. No particular geographical hotspots, um, but there is a, a trend we're seeing. Now that could be because more of this crime is now being reported. Uh, there's been lots of high profile things recently which has resulted in an awful lot more of this style of crime being reported. Um, Kevin's example of the and Billy getting in a car with a 45 year old male probably isn't, isn't necessarily the best example. Um, but what I would be suggesting would be the example I'd be looking for and what I'd be doing with the resources is using our PCSA teams to be spending time randomly outside different colleges and schools looking for those 14 year old girls going off with a 17, 18 year old boy. And, and that's the sort of, um, you know, we always think the most horrendous things about the CSE, but actually there's a whole raft of different severity of offences and it's those offences particularly we would be seeking to uh, pick up on from an intelligence gaming perspective and also from an over disruptive perspective as well by using our PCSO resources at those times in those locations. Thank you. And, 
Mm -hmm. Sorry, Councillor Scott, is it alright if we move on because time's really getting on? And you could perhaps speak to Nick afterwards. I don't think I don't think I've actually taken any more time than anybody else. No, but no, I'll leave but, the other yeah. one. Okay, thanks. I'm just gonna ask councillors now because the time is getting on. If you could really make your your questions short if possible. Um, Elisa. Thank you. And I'll try and be very brief. Uh, part of it is because I'm new, so, uh, so my, my question might very well be answered from in the past, but I don't know. The last time I attended a crime, um, police and crime panel meeting in Cambridge here, March was made because I live in Orchard Park, which is just outside the city boundaries. And they made a lot of noise about the fact that they have an increase in incidents and reports of cyber crime, and which includes things like cyberbullying and identity theft and things like that. But I've not heard it mentioned today at all, so I was just wondering if it was on the radar or if it's not something that you deal with. I think um, cyber crime and cyber enabled crime is, is the crime of today. It's obviously crime moves with the times, and you will look back, and certainly when I joined, we used to get ground raids in, in Norfolk City, we used to have a horrendous amount of burglaries, theft from motor vehicles. Those trends have changed dramatically. We're now seeing a huge increase in frauds, online cyber frauds. I, mean, I could. I could uh, Example the sort of things we see where you get spam emails all the time from different people who are trying to defraud you. So we do see a large amount of those offences uh, on the increase. The community team is very much boots on ground. Um, it's, it's not really it has the expertise to necessarily combat that per se. We do have a crime reduction officer who specialises in, in, in that sort of stuff and they are able to do it. We've also got a cyber fraud team as well in Cambridgeshire, um, which is a, an ever increasing team as well. Um, sadly, it's a, it's a new type of crime, but that does always take people off the front line and takes the boots off the grounds to staff those sort of teams as well. So we are moving with the times, um, but from a community angle, it's a very, very difficult uh, area for the community team to police in person. Also, the Army Road one, which isn't just speeding, but it's basically anti social driving. And there's, there's so that would be really good to be able to take back to people that you are going to be looking at that in some way, whether it's general or specific, because it's exactly the same as when it happens in Ben Road, it's just happening at the moment in King's Hedges. Um, and actually, the other thing was just to say thank you to you lot, because I happen to think you all do a really good job and under great pressure. So, uh, all com other comments aside, thank you has to be one of them. Okay, the next one is um, Councillor Wolfram. Thank you, seems to be the name, it's not put the hand up, mate. Um, still on the subject of King's Edges, um, King's Edges Road <coughs> speed, and now, I'm quite, quite apart from, from Mr. White, he, 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 he reported this to me and the other councillors in, in King's Edges, obviously to yourself as well, but I've, over the last week I've had complaints about um, anti-social driving from um, other residents further, further, right further back down King's Edges Road as far as uh, opposite St Kilda Avenue. And what they're telling me is that um, they get, you get these boy races that are, are ganging together and, and, and congregating in the, um, the, the business park. Um, yeah, and, um, and it sounds to me from what um, Mr. White was saying that they're, they're actually using that as a drag run, drag run. Um, so I know there's, uh, I don't know if this still is, but there used to be two roving CCTV cameras that they could put up temporarily. Yeah, they are. Well, perhaps, perhaps one of them should be put in, in that car park for a few nights over a weekend um, to see, because it's, it's in the middle of the night, um, to see if there is this congregation and perhaps one on, on, on King's Edge Road itself to see if we can catch them in the act. Okay, yeah. okay well, the 
James Cameron, I will say it because I think Richard's going to say probably the same thing as me about watching video footage yesterday, so I'll leave it to the rest of the class. <laughs> James Taylor. Thank you. Um, so we've had our local sergeant here and one of the city's most um, senior detective inspectors tell us that it takes them hours to watch through footage to find the point at which a bike is stolen. That is, of course, unnecessary and nonsense. They can go straight to the middle, see if it's there or not in the middle, and then look um, at the appropriate halfway through that quarter or three quarters through and do a binary chart or a binary search and spending very little time identify the point at which the, the, the bike is stolen. I think this is such an ongoing problem um, the statements that you get from the police, it would be really helpful if um, in your priorities that you make today you actually mention this and tell the police that they can do that kind of thing and deal with CCTV much more efficiently. I'd also like to raise a different issue on communication. Um, so on the, the 5th of June we had an incident on King's Parade in the city where there was a suspect package and um, the Cambridge News then um, called the police and the response that the Cambridge News got was that the police were not going to comment until the next morning. Now when the Cambridge News contacts the police, they're contacting the police on behalf of everybody. They're trying to get information for residents of the city. And it's completely unacceptable in my view for the police to say they're not going to comment um, until the next morning. Now in case we have um, another serious incident, that's a relatively serious incident, people were evacuated from their homes, which a good fraction of the city centre was evacuated. There's some great examples from around the country now. Um, we've seen in Manchester recently, we've seen the um, terrorism police nationally um, from London um, responding to incidents and giving out information promptly. I think the police locally in Cambridge needs to um, see the importance of communicating with people when there is a major incident so that people can inform themselves and protect themselves and make informed decisions um, on what to do. So I'd like to see that, um, that being improved. The last comment I'd like to make is on the statistics that you've got to this meeting. I think it's excellent that we've now got um, the injury statistics that go with the violent crime. And I hope that um, this evening you will be persuaded by those injury statistics to attempt to reduce the amount of injuries that have been caused in relation to crime. But if you reduce those, it's to urge your councillors to take. If you can get those, get those numbers down, you're having a significant impact on people's lives. What I think is still missing from the statistics, though, is there's nothing here on um, traffic offences, despite the fact that you set priorities on two traffic-related matters. That's a key omission. I don't see how you can um, be setting the local priorities if you don't have um, the statistics you need on traffic. And, of course, um, traffic and roads is another area of injuries, so we should be getting that, that information. And I don't think we should be asking our local sergeant to put time into getting this, these statistics. Nationally, we get a lot of effort put into presenting police statistics. The police.uk website does uh, mapping and presentation statistics. I'll urge you to make that to give you the information that you need. Because if you do that, you fix it not just for this panel here, but you fix it for every panel like this across the country. And I think you um, are probably further ahead than any other police panel across the country in terms of what you're demanding and the information you're demanding. So I urge you to keep going on that and to improve things. Um, improve these the, the things for everybody. And of course you've got the numbers of injuries, but there's nothing yet there on severity of injuries. And I think that's an important thing to be um, to be seeking so that you're properly informed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Um, okay then. Um, I've just got one issue to bring up and that is in East Chesterton recently we've had quite a few accidents. Um, one on Green End Road where a Land Rover went through five Gardens. Yes. Um, there was one just recently down uh, the high street near the nursing home. It looks like it went through the bushes. As you come out St Andrews Road, it's know. gone straight across by the looks of it. Um, and there was a couple of others. Uh, the bollards were taken out on the high street up near the, the uh, laundriette. The speeding car hit them and three of the bollards are gone. So there is a lot of speed in East Chesterton, I just want to bring it to your attention. Okay. So now we're going to go ahead now and look at priorities. And I'm going to hand this over to, what, to my conjoint, okay? No, no, I'm really chair suggesting you do moving the recommendation on page yeah. 46 to, to propose three. Yeah. And then it's up to the you know, committee to okay. discuss okay. what they think the top three should be. Yeah. Uh, and I'm trying to reflect on the discussion we've heard tonight and also the um, points about local issues that have been mentioned uh, by members of the public here, as well as the councillors and uh, the email that I mean. Uh, so so I'm, I'm suggesting that if there's any my proposal, it's up to us to discuss them, that uh, the three that we look at are antisocial behaviour around Fen Road. Um, I think that's uh, 
an issue, particularly in terms of recent workfare, that um, is uh, something to be ongoing. Um, so that's, um, that's recommendation um, three, and on page 46. Um, the fourth one, uh, special motor vehicles, looking at figures on page 45, that's a clear, a clear reason, I can understand why that's been put in there. Um, maybe the recommendation to just perhaps make the point that it's um, uh, in respect of the, the data in north of the city um, that that um, recommendation is adopted. And then I would suggest um, um, recommendation five on road safety, uh, but um, following on the, um, the uh, after speed watch, uh, suggesting that it be really, uh, with particular reference to Arby Road, King's Edge Road and Gilbert Road, because I think listening to the discussion tonight, those are three particular areas, and I do think we do need to you know, um, try and emphasise where the local authorities are coming from, with, coming from within North area. So I would suggest particularly re particular reference to Arby Road, King's Edge Road and Gilbert Road uh, in terms of the road safety items. So that, that, that's for me my proposal, is that for discussion and debate for the rest of the, uh, the committee? Okay, I'm speaking on behalf of the Chesterton group. Uh, we'd like to still see the, the Fen Road um, as a priority. And, and myself, I'd still like the child exploitation um, on there as well. Okay. Next one. Anybody else would like to put anything forward? No? Councillor Austin. Um, I find it very hard not to accept the child sexual exploitation one because I think it's so serious. Yes, but it is a particular North area um, issue, uh, and I think we need we need more detail um, if we're going to assess that as a priority. Obviously, the um, the theft from motor vehicles is self-evident from the stats that you provided. Um, over many, many years, we are conscious of the antisocial behaviour on Fen Road, and uh, <coughs> uh, I'm very pleased to hear that you've been crossing the railway line, um, <laughs> because obviously we believe some of the problems come from the other side of the railway line, um, and uh, we've heard from many residents about the issues of, of speeding and road safety. So I would support the three that have been put forward by Councillor Tulcher. Councillor Smart. Thank you. So, um, I think the thing is, it's very difficult to um, choose here because uh, we've got a kind of the system has been changed somewhat on the night, as far as I can see. I wasn't quite aware this was going to happen, that the police are going to bring their six or so priorities to us, and then we're going to have to sort of choose from them and the things that residents are coming to us. So obviously, you know, child exploitation trumps police, um, you know, sort of motoring offences and such like. But it's, that's not I the think way that we've been doing it in the past. Normally, we, you know, this is the residents, we knock on doors and stuff, we pick up stuff like, you know, when there's like needles in the hallway and flats and stuff like that, you know, and that's all useful stuff. And I know some of the things that we bring are very small scale in terms of the sort of work you do. But that's sort of where we've come from normally, it's like directly from residents, <coughs> not from us personally, but from residents. So to bring these sort of bigger issues to us, although from what's been said this evening already by both of you about child um, exploitation and such like, is very concerning and in a sense that's as concerning if not more so because of the actual subject matter than anything that residents have said to me in the last few months. I think However, what I'd say yep. is they are six <laughs> issues as, as the boss rightly says, we can add value to what we do. Mm -hmm. Do not think that if you say, actually, I believe the residents of North of the City have said to me, I am concerned about, oh, I am concerned <coughs> about road safety, I am concerned about Fen Road, I am concerned about Green Space ASP. Do not believe, do not think that we are going to stop working at CSE. This is about us adding value. It's about us doing above and beyond. And if you feel, and rightly you do, that you are the voice of the people that you are here to represent, and you think actually the thing we should add value to is road safety in the north of the city, don't think by saying that that we're going to disband the on-make safe team and we're going to stop doing all that work 
Are we still going to do that? One of my PCs is very, very good at it and committed to it. And he would love us to say, actually, Paul, instead of doing 10% of your time, 20% of your time for that, but if, it's, if you're saying the most important thing is what you're being told by the residents is that thing, tell us and we will do that. We will add the value to what you think we should add the value to. These are relatively broad subjects. The thing is, when you look at it, and you rightly do, you look at CSE and you watch the television programme that was on last month, and you watch all that, and it is a vital piece of work that we do. Just because you say you think the people that you represent think that we should deal with road safety doesn't mean we won't deal with it. Please continue to act and continue to say, actually, no, you're right, that's important. I'm not telling you it's not. But the people are saying to me that actually, this is what's important. And if that's what they're telling you, this is the forum for you to tell us. And do not sit there, and you're right, I go to a monthly meeting about CSE, and you sit there and you go, this is, for the people that are involved in this, it is catastrophic. But that work will still go on. That team still exists, that team still does a lot of work. It's a multi multidisciplinary team. There are people who work for the city council, there are people who work for the county council for addressing these issues. This is extra work we can do to help. And trust me, hand on heart, I would help them anyway. Because that's why. Right. But if you're saying to me, actually, I think road safety is one, do not think that by saying that, all that other good work's on that. It's about I've got my my PCSOs have got a choice of saying actually I can go down I can do something about this or I can do something about that. Wait a minute, the residents are saying this is important. And this is where I'm going to go. So it's about adding value. It's about extra. It's about uh, extra. Don't worry that I appreciate what you're saying. That's a big thing that it's something in there and going kind of, oh my god that happens, doesn't it? And potentially it, it, we we can address it. But don't think by me saying you saying actually the people that I'm here to represent say this is important is wrong. It's not wrong. That's the, that's the point of this process. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Right. I've got the last two people. So I've got Jocelyn and then I've got Patrick. So Jocelyn. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I support the three proposals that were put forward by. Um, Councillor Todd Jones, at the same time, I want to say to you, make absolutely no mistake, there are at least three councillors in this group, Councillor Bird, Councillor Austin and Councillor Scott, who consider that child sexual exploitation is a huge issue and who are absolutely supportive of you in your work in this area. Now, please let me finish. And I want to say this as well, that I believe the message has to go through to whoever the prosecutors are in this uh, Cambridgeshire, that when somebody is prosecuted too for downloading child exploitative material from the internet, what has to get through is that there are actually children there being abused because it's always reported as if somehow you download something from the internet and that's the only thing that's happening. You are looking at these images. It's real children there who are being abused and that message is not getting through to the courts because in the cases that have I read in the Cambridge News of late where somebody's been prosecuted for that, it is never projected as if there is a real child who is the subject of, real children who are the subject of that, that, those photographic you, you, you are You are pre preaching to both, both to myself and Mr. Yeah, Stewart. I'm preaching it, to it, 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 yeah. it costs him four hours every time there's a meeting because on my day off, I drive to Huntingdon and I go to the meeting. I will go to that meeting religiously, even if I'm not at work, and then I just charge him extra money. <laughs> we, we, trust me, we do everything we can. We do, yeah. We, uh, yes. Thank you. Um, Councillor Shield? Um, thank you. I'm just wondering how we um, avoid the temptation to choose ones that have a bearing on our own casework. Because I have a worry that you know, if it was just me, I'd pick something that does have a bearing on my current case work. 
and that might be unfair on, 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 on the other. Um, so, so, but I understand that. Um, so again, yeah, balance of issues. So, for example, um, I would pick one, two, and five. But, 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 but how are we, how are we, how are we actually reaching a decision? I mean, this is more a question to. My expectation is a democratic one. Everyone sits there and goes, "My ones so, are here." Is there? Is there? I shall ask. I shall ask. Thank you. Okay. So let's go through then. Okay. Number one, combating. Uh, sorry, combating uh, county lines drug dealing. Can we have a vote on who wants to go for number one as a priority? Three. Okay. The next one, child sexual exploitation. How would you like to put that forward? Can I ask a question? Are we both? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, Child exploitation. Okay, road safety. Okay. And antisocial behaviour in green spaces. No. Okay, so the figures I've got is road safety got 10 votes. Um, the next one along was the uh, child sexual exploitation, got nine votes. Antisocial behaviour driving on Fen Road um, was eight votes. The next one was theft from a motor vehicle was five. And combating county lines drug dealing was three. Okay, so... Thank you very much, everybody. I close the meeting. Sorry, it was such a long one. <laughs>